Welcome to FHFA's third roundtable discussion. To those of you watching us live, we are in Indianola, Mississippi, and are pleased to be holding, it, uh, holding our session here today at the B.B. King Museum. Our discussion today will explore the Federal Home Loan Bank's role, uh, or potential role, in support uh, of underserved communities. My name is Joshua Stallings. I am the Deputy Director of the Division of Federal Home Loan Bank Regulation, and I am joined by LaRonda Ely, our Senior Economist, uh, and she's going to actually be our moderator today. Uh, we would like to thank our esteemed roundtable participants, our guests joining us here in person, and all of you uh, watching us live on the stream. We have been very pleased with our live, the live, the high level of stakeholder interest. Uh, LaRonda, as I said before, will be your moderator today, and I'll turn it over to her for some opening remarks. Thank you for the introduction, Joshua. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here at this Rural Housing Roundtable in my home state of Mississippi. I bring you greetings from our director, Sandra Thompson, who is also, or who also has Mississippi roots as her parents are from Mississippi, but they migrated to Chicago during the Great Migration. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us in the audience, as well as those who are participating and listening to us on our live stream. As Joshua iterated, thank you so much to our distinguished panel of guests. We are looking forward to this very um, insightful conversation and dialogue. Um, I, we would also like to extend our well wishes to two of our roundtable participants who were <clears throat> unable to join us today for un due to unforeseen circumstances. Ms. Andrea Barnes from the Mississippi Center for Justice as well as Angela Curry from the Greenwood LaFleur Carroll um, County Economic Development Foundation. So this is our third roundtable discussion. Um, for the benefit of those who may be joining us for the first time, we were just in Chicago. Again, today we are in Indianola, Mississippi, where we will be talking about uh, affordable housing and community development as it relates to rural housing, uh, rural communities. And just, un and just under three weeks ago, we hosted our inaugural roundtable in Washington, D.C., where we explored questions on the mission and purpose of the federal home loan bank system. And while in Chicago, uh, we explored um, issues as it relates to financially vulnerable communities. These roundtables are the second phase of our Federal Home Loan Bank System 100, focusing on the future initiative. With our, the centennial of the Federal Home Loan Banks approaching, Director Thompson felt that now was a good time as any to conduct a comprehensive review of the Federal Home Loan Bank System. We kicked off the comprehensive review, um, which turned out into a three-day, three-part listening session due to such high level of interest. Again, today's session will cover rural communities. We do welcome bold ideas. Some of the ideas that you present may require legislative action to implement, but we welcome recommendations that can also be implemented in the near term. This is especially true for times during market stress, particularly for smaller Federal Home Loan Bank members that don't often have access to funding. Um, even with this truth, again, we invite you to speak boldly and candidly about your ideas for the Federal Home Loan Bank system. In this and future roundtable discussions, we're going to be asking some very big questions on the bank's role or potential role in addressing housing finance, community, and economic development needs and affordability needs um, that are unique to rural as well as financially vulnerable um, populations. We hope to extend that reach too. This is of course part of a big initiative and um, we understand that not all um, issues are, are the same everywhere. As our director has repeatedly stated, we are looking forward to engaging our key stakeholders and with that in mind, I'll ask Joshua to share some of our rules of engagement today. All right, thank you. So the fun part, how, 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 we, how we play nice. <clears throat> okay, so LaRonda is gonna be moderating our discussion today and she's going to be directing questions to the roundtable participants. Uh, 
We expect and hope that we will have an open engagement and discussion, and no recommendations or views should be considered off the table. Uh, and we encourage you to offer differing views about some important questions that we will be covering this afternoon. Uh, we also want this to be orderly. Uh, as such, we, we will ask that everyone turn their name placard to the side so that LaRonda can know to call on you if you want to speak. So only if, so if, if you are want to respond to somebody else's response, turn your placard to the side. She will know to call on you at that time. Uh, and we will we can keep the conversation kind of moving uh, without people talking over each other. Uh, uh, and to ensure that everyone has a turn to speak and that we cover uh, the discussion points that we want to cover, if someone is going long, LaRonda will, in, will interject to keep the conversation going. Uh, so third, we will have a break roughly halfway through today's event. Uh, when we get to that point, we will, we will signal it for you. Uh, also, I have a disclaimer I have to read from our legal folks, uh, so please bear with me as I'm going to be reading this directly off the page. We have organized this roundtable to obtain your input on the mission of the Federal Home, ba Home Loan Banks, including input on several specific questions that were sent to you prior to the meeting. During today's session, FHFA will not discuss the status or timing of any potential rulemaking. If FHFA does, does in, decide to engage in a rulemaking on any matters discussed today, this meeting would not take the place of a public comment process. The rulemaking document would establish the public comment process and you would need to submit your comments, if any, in accordance with the submission instructions in that document. FHFA may summarize the feedback gathered at today's session in, in a future, future rulemaking document if we determine that a summary would be useful to explain the, the basis of, of a rulemaking. Anything said in this meeting, and that also includes reactions, nodding, eye-rolling, should not be construed as binding on or final decision by the director of FHFA or FHFA staff. Any questions we may have are focused on understanding your views and do not indicate a policy or legal position. Participants in today's roundtable may have a financial interest, whether direct or indirect, on outcomes that may affect the federal home loan banks and their businesses. Today's roundtable will be live streamed on FHFA's website and video recorded. FHFA may also prepare a transcript of today's session, which would include the names of all speakers and the organizations they represent, if any. The recording and any transcripts prepared will be prepared will be posted on FHFA's website and YouTube channel, along with any materials being presented today uh, or otherwise submitted in conjunction with the roundtable. With that, I'll turn it back over to Laurent to get us going. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, just to reiterate, I'm really excited about this very dynamic panel we have. I know you all have a lot to say and a lot of insights to share, but we are going to ask that your statements are concise um, and insightful, of course. And um, I am, as the moderator, if I have to pull your coattail a little bit and so that we can move on and make sure that everyone has equal opportunity to speak, as my grandmother would say, please charge it to my head and not my heart. Uh, we have had the opportunity to meet and dialogue with you all prior to sitting at the table and at lunch, but we have, may have those in the audience as well as those on our live stream who are not familiar. So we're going to ask that we go around the table and that you briefly introduce yourselves, um, tell us who you are, any affiliation that you have, the community rep that you represent, and also um, any affiliation that you may have to the Federal Home Loan Banks. And I'll start to my left. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Hines. I am a partner with Gray Consulting and Investigations, and I have in the past and still currently work with nonprofits um, in leadership roles and as a consultant. But I would say in this particular instance, it is my role as an advocate for individuals who find themselves um, living in or are a part of underserved communities when it comes to housing today will be my role. My name is Daniel Boggs. I'm the CEO of Greater Greenville Housing uh, and Greater Greenville Development Foundation in Greenville, Mississippi. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization uh, that has uh, utilized federal home loan bank funds for various activities uh, within Greenville, Mississippi, including uh, down payment assistance, homeowner rehab, and uh, new development for affordable housing. 
Uh, so I'm here, uh, we utilize uh, Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati funds and Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas, which are uh, currently within that network uh, with partnering banks. So here's the developer side. Yes, my name is Calvin King. I'm with Arkansas Land and Farm Development Corporation. And uh, we're involved with housing development uh, uh, from a syndication perspective and using uh, tax credit uh, uh, for development along with the uh, acquisition and rehab as far as uh, affordable housing. Uh, we also have worked with farmers uh, for rural community economic development uh, addressing the issue of the lack of uh, equality and equity as it relates to the African American uh, population, particularly uh, communities where you have uh, more of the uh, disenfranchised segments of the population uh, as a whole, particularly when you look at uh, uh, Eastern Arkansas, the Delta region uh, here in in the U.S., Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, and areas. We have a subsidiary organization, Arkansas Land Community Development Corporation, uh, that works to uh, deal with the program service delivery uh, from both the advocacy, technical assistance perspective, as well as workforce readiness with youth. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Cindy Holler, and I am the CEO of Community Housing Capital. And we're based in Atlanta, uh, but we're affiliated with the NeighborWorks Network. So we lend nationally to communities all over the country. So varying from rural areas like the Delta to big cities. Um, but we specialize really in early lending um, and allowing the not-for-profits of the NeighborWorks Network to take a idea and conceive it and get it ready to be financed. But one of the things that we've learned is that those same organizations um, really need long-term fixed rate financing. So we joined the Federal Home Loan Bank system in 2008, I believe, is before my time, but, um, and recently have been an active user of, as we've moved our organizations from thinking about a blank piece of paper to actually implementing over the long term, which is what we think it takes to do community development. Um, my background is both in real estate development and in lending, so I've been on both sides of the table. So I'm very happy to be here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, my name is Mala Brooks. I am a county supervisor for Washington County. My biggest concern is number one, identifying ways for people here in Washington County and Delta to become homeowners. As most of you know, the Mississippi Delta is one of the poorest regions in the nation. And just identifying ways that you know, they can be a part of the American Pie, but also the economic development side is a big concern here in our region as well. So I'm here for the citizens to identify their concerns along with the economic development piece for uh, a growing region for the Delta. Thank you. I'm John Olamey, I'm President and CEO of Southern Bank Corps Bank. First, let me say it's a pleasure to be here. Second, fantastic disclaimer there. Um, <laughs> as a lawyer, I should say that I'm, I'm very proud of my brothers for being able to draft that. I feel like I should draft something myself. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the President and CEO of Southern Bank Corps Bank. We're a $2.5 billion regulated bank. We're also a community development financial institution, which is designated by the U.S. Treasury. That We originate at least 60% of our credits in low to moderate income areas annually. Uh, we have 54 locations. We are primarily in some of most, in the most impoverished areas of Arkansas and Mississippi. We also have a nonprofit um, Southern Bank Corp Capital Partners, uh, which is a loan fund, which is also a CDFI that works in partnership with us, which allows us to be creative at times when, when we can be. Good afternoon, I'm David Jackson. Delta Housing Development Corporation, and actually based right here in Indianola, so welcome to our home. <laughs> and we are a, basically, we, we actually a practitioner, we are a developer, we have management. And, and so we, we, we try to just deliver affordable housing throughout the, uh, actually throughout the Delta, even though we are based here, but we have worked all, basically all across the Delta over the years. We've been around since 1971 doing this type of work, and we really see the agency having a greater need of existing going forward because unlike we would think, the demand for affordable housing is actually increasing instead of decreasing. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ed Sivak. I'm the Chief Policy and Communications Officer at Hope Credit Union. 
Um, Bill Bynum, our chief executive officer, sends his regards and unfortunately was not able to be here today. Uh, a little bit about HOPE. Um, HOPE is one of the largest black and women-owned financial institutions in America. Um, we have 35,000 members, but each day our products and services touch about 105,000 people living in the households that we serve. Uh, we are based in Jackson, Mississippi, but have five locations here in the Mississippi Delta and also locations in Arkansas, Tennessee, Louisiana, and Alabama. Um, we are a member of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas. Uh, we are a consumer of its programs, whether it's AHP or SNAP or HELP, those are all acronyms that I know we can unpack later. Um, and we also do work with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Atlanta. So appreciate the opportunity to be here today and look forward to the discussion. Uh, last but not least, um, I'm Julie Brooks with Mississippi Home Corporation, um, the Federal Home Loan Grant Pro Program Coordinator. Um, we are the state housing finance agency, like I said, for Mississippi, and our mission is, um, you know, we want to make sure that every Mississippian has safe, decent, and affordable housing. Um, we have the tax credits for the states um, that many of you are aware of or have used. Um, we have the home funds, which help with rehab, um, Chodo, T Chodo funds to help with nonprofits for development or rehab, um, tax credits, down payment assistance programs for individuals who are looking to purchase a home. Um, so we did a little bit of everything. One of uh, the programs that are near and dear to my heart is the HUD Housing Counseling Grant Program that we have, where we fund housing counseling agencies um, in the state to provide um, home buyer education counseling, rental counseling, foreclosure prevention counseling. Um, all of those things are vital to anyone that is wanting to either improve their housing situation or maintain their situation. Thank you all for um, sharing what you do and your affiliations. Uh, it is quite obvious that we have a broad spectrum of participants <clears throat> who are representing the various areas and facets of, of housing. We have bankers, CDFIs, funders, um, those of you who are in community development, um, housing development and community development, as well as those who are advocates. So I think we are well suited for, again, um, just a very informative conversation. And with that said, I'll start with one of the first questions. What are some of the housing challenges um, that you see that are specific to rural areas? or rural areas in America in general. And I'll start with um, David. Yeah. Probably what I'm gonna say, it may echo around the nation, but <laughs> but being in Delta, or the, one, of the, uh, one of the poorest areas in the nation, um, the, the challenge, the problem is uh, dealing with home ownership is uh, trying to make it affordable. You know, uh, and that's uh, a broad term, but uh, it, it is very uh, relevant to what to the work that we do. We need to, uh, and and I don't think we want to get into maybe specific at this time, but we're gonna have to come up with 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 ways to uh, get help people get into homes. Actually, and, and and somebody gonna like push back on me for this but to help get them to the home before we think they are ready. And, and because we want to wait till credit scores get to 720. We want to wait till they get a certain amount of money in the bank. We want to wait uh, for other people to learn or uh, to have a chance to live and grow. And I think we're gonna have to start to do more to meet them where they are in order to push that dream into their life because uh, it, it's getting tough. So it, it, here with, with poverty being what it is, income being what it is, we, we just can't continue <clears throat> to wait until they get there. So we're looking for ways to help them along the way. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, as an advocate, what would you say you hear is the maybe top two or three challenges that individuals face when it comes to obtaining um, decent and affordable housing? So first of all, I, Mr. Jackson, I could not agree with you more. So let's start there. Um, one of the things that I find that is most intriguing, both when working with individuals who are looking for housing, 
but also trying to understand the housing process. We always talk about education. We want you to be here. We want you to have these things because in reality, you do want to set people up for success and not failure. However, when you're in a community that economically or in a region economically that is not poised to pay literally the types of salaries and incomes that will create that level of success, then we have to do a two-part kind of thought process. If you look at what it costs to pay a mortgage in this community and you look at rental prices, which are growing astronomically across the country, you will find that if a person can pay $900 a month in rent, then if we can put them in a house for $600, Somewhere there's a difference, that's a savings, and if we can get them to understand or get bankers to understand, okay, well, look, this is an extra $300, $400, in some case, $1,100 and $600, $500 savings that we can then put in place for this family, we are really setting them up for success. So we can't use the age-old model of, yes, you need a $720 and $800 to be in this level of housing, we have to have a discussion, not only around education, but around what the figures really show, which is I've saved this much money, but I'm having to expand double what it would cost me to be in a house, to be in a rental unit. Thank you. Um, John, coming from the financial side of things, I'm hearing that um, Mr. Jackson and um, David and Cynthia made two agreed on the point that um, sometimes we should consider putting people in the home before they're ready. What Do you have a take or thoughts on that being who those individuals would be coming to for a mortgage, perhaps? Well, certainly I don't think we should be put people in the homes until they are ready. Now, being ready, we can debate what, what being ready really means. <laughs> what um, it looks like. I, there are plenty of people that are ready for a home with a credit score below 720. Um, what we've got to do as an industry really is, is, is try to help people figure out either one, A, how to improve that credit. Um, at Southern, we, we, we require every employee to have a credit repair discussion with at least 12 people a year. And we have 500 employees. So it's, it's a constant, it's not necessarily education. Most people don't understand how credit scores are actually generated, but if you can have those conversations about, hey, go out there and pull a free credit report and let's find out what's on it and let's see if we can improve that. Uh, we want to put people in homes. Um, I, I think it's more than just the financing piece as well. It's a lack of supply of affordable housing mm -hmm. and the economics on that, I think we, we talked about it at lunch, are, are, are getting harder. But clearly cash flow is, is very important um, if you can find the savings there. Uh, one of the big, hairy, audacious goals uh, at Southern is we want to put 100,000 people either in affordable housing or provide affordable housing over the next, we say 10 years, we're three years into this process. Um, so it's, it's important to us, um, and we want to make sure everybody's got an opportunity to do it. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the lack of supply. Julie. Yes. Um, can you speak to the supply? Uh, housing supply stock, or do you have any thoughts on that? Well, as far as, okay, there's different ways I can look at this. Um, we do have construction lending programs, things like that, that can assist with the development. However, keeping things affordable, um, you know, that is one of our missions. Um, as far as income limits, um, a lot of our programs for tax credits, um, home programs, they assist individuals um, or families at 80% of area median income and below. Um, as far as the actual individual person, uh, family, um, trying to get affordable housing, I think a lot of it boils down to one, education, um, and then knowing the resources that are available to them. Um, you have different programs out there that can, you can assist that can assist the individual um, with layering as far as down payment assistance. Um, if you have um, a family who may be utilizing the Section 8 homeowner rental ship, I'm sorry, the rental voucher, that can be converted into a homeownership voucher 
which for 20 years, um, it, that voucher will assist that family up to 15 years uh, with paying for their mortgage. And then if it's a loan that's less than 20 years, then I believe the assistance is 10. Um, but that's designed to help get that family um, to where at the end of that 10 or 15 year period so they can afford that loan. Um, other things that you can pair with that um, are the home funds, down payment assistance, which we should have coming up in the near future, um, AHP funds, or the, um, I believe it's HELP funds through um, Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas. Um, so there's, it just depends on what's available to that family, um, especially at 80% of your median income. Um, you know, they do have some more opportunities. Um, and it's just, you know, like they've mentioned, saving. Not everybody's going to have the perfect credit score. That's a number that can either increase or decrease. But it's getting that education and that information out there um, because a lot of families have uh, generational ways of learning how my parents spent my, their money. And it's just getting all that information out there. Great. Thank you. Um, Daniel, as a developer, can you speak to um, the stock of housing supply um, in rural areas, I guess, as it specifically relates to this particular region? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you know, with us being Greater Greenville Housing, uh, you know, we do focus a lot on the market uh, and the needs and the demands within uh, not only Greenville but the Delta region as a whole. Um, you know, and we conducted a market study, uh, even when David, David was with Rural Lisk uh, several years ago, uh, that said that specifically uh, the Greenville community could support 2,000 new affordable housing units uh, within our region. Uh, not because, and again, I think what we're seeing in rural America as a whole is a substantial decrease in population. Uh, we've seen it uh, all around the Mississippi Delta, Arkla, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana Delta, uh, people are moving away for better jobs, better opportunities. Um, so supply is there. It's just the uh, inadequate amount of decent housing that's here. Uh, specifically in Greenville, Mississippi, 54% uh, of the housing stock was built before 1967. Uh, only 6%, uh, we have 16,000 uh, housing units in Greenville, Mississippi, but only 6% has been built since 1995. Uh, so even though you do have a, a large amount of homes that are, are cheaper, uh, they're older, uh, they have a lot of uh, issues whenever it comes to uh, being functional uh, and, and being up to code. Uh, so even if we can kind of put some people in these homes, and you, you might even see this, John, is you know we try to make it an effort and push to get somebody into a home that they can't afford, but whenever they get in, the repairs are so substantial uh, that they can't continue to keep up with those maintenance issues. Uh, and again, I think that that's an educational component as well is it's not just being able to make that mortgage payment, but it's also to make sure you understand uh, the importance of going out for your insurance uh, you know, every couple of years, uh, looking for those small signs of leaks uh, to make sure that, that house does not fall into further disrepair. Uh, but in, in regards to Greenville, uh, just because the existing housing stock is considered to be old, functionally obsolete, and possess several safety issues, uh, there's a huge need in rural America for, for affordable housing. Thank you. Um, I want to pivot just a little bit and ask a question about um, as it relates to demographics. So earlier in um, talking to some stakeholders, we learned that um, in terms of age demographics, right, in rural areas, particularly here, um, there's a substantial amount of the population that um, is that are of senior age or el the elderly community. Um, Cindy, do you have any thoughts on the the need or, or or the uniqueness of needs for the for older populations? Uh, yes, uh, I think you know it's interesting because I was reflecting on something David said a little while ago about patients, right? And in many, especially rural areas, that uh, and I'm more familiar, quite honestly, with North Dakota and South Dakota, which have both of those rural areas have lost so much population to big cities and left behind sort of the senior community that is supposed to be holding up the infrastructure without with their hospital systems are moving out and um, I, I would imagine there may be some similarities to the Delta but not exactly um, so y you know you're almost uh, in some ways isolating a senior population 
in a community where the housing stock is failing, okay, because it's past its useful life. And so how do we kind of provide support for those populations that actually are not able to access transportation to get good health care, et cetera, and maybe in a places where, um, where the IT systems don't actually let them access the telehealth programs, or certainly, and maybe they're not even adept enough to be able to access those kinds of programs. So it's a, I think it's a big problem. Um, I would love to say I have tons of solutions for that, but I think I don't. It's, it's a tough one, and I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that we've been experts at that, because most of the experience I've seen uh, in success in senior populations has been in you know, multifamily housing, right, where, where there's more um, congregate care or seniors taking care of each other in settings of, you know, at least 20 units or more, and that's, um, that's not what I necessarily see in the rural areas that we have. I see a single house in the middle of farmland, and what do we do about that? So um, I think I'm good at explaining the, the problem. Loranda, but I, I'm not sure I, I, I really gave you a lot of solutions there, so I will look to the experts to, to end the sentence, okay? Well, ho hopefully as we continue to dialogue, yeah. the solutions will, will come to you, and please feel free to turn your tent card as well as everyone else <laughs> and, uh, and share those thoughts and ideas. I want to uh, go to Ma uh, Mala. So also, it just kind of piggybacks off of what you were just saying. Um, there is also, you know, these there are these missing connections, right? There are these other infrastructure type needs that that people need. So, Mala, what do you hear from your constituency regarding um, what they need in terms of economic and um, community development to better support their housing needs or complement the support for their housing needs? Um. I would say I would say starting out just with technical assistance, uh, even going back it, the generational piece. You may have a family that lived in public housing for 20 years. So when you look at that 20 years and now you're ready about home, it goes back to Mr. Jackson saying prepare to become homeowners. First of all, you got to learn how to take care of home. You're not used to cutting your grades. You're not used to paying your insurance. So. The education piece is going to be real important. Not more so just telling that person you should do this. Really finding a program where they're getting used to doing things that homeowners do. The other piece is, again, credit weather, uh, worthiness. And the concern with that, I wouldn't say lower the credit standard, but raise the bar for people on how, how do we, we uh, put ourselves on a budget. Uh, another piece is sometimes you may run into a person um, they are ready to become a homeowner, but they may have some debt. Five or six years ago, things have changed, and because of the job where they're in Mississippi Delta, financially, they just cannot take care of those. So if there's a pot of money to help people who become credit worthiness and ready to move forward, help them to help bring their credit up to, to get rid of some old debt that they picked up, maybe they were young, you know, doing some things they just didn't make good decisions on. And um, I would say another piece is, it's just more like they come to you to the bank. They're talking to you about buying a home, they're having a discussion. Well, that one discussion is not gonna be enough. It's really just having hands-on programs to help bring people to the level where they should be so they can be prepared to become homeowners. And I think if we have more hands-on, more conversation, more programs, I think it would make a difference. And the other piece is a lot of programs like Mississippi Home Corp have, most citizens don't know anything about it. It's, it's relatively new. So the other piece is awareness, finding ways to make sure that the everyday person who's interested in becoming a homeowner know about these programs. And I think they'll take more advantage of those programs more so than an elected official bringing it out, but they're not reaching the whole community, just certain members. Thank you for bringing that out in terms of um, education and information. So I want to come back to, oh, thank you, John. I'm yes. playing by the rules here. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I just wanted to address one comment you made. I think you're exactly right, which at, at Southern, a lot of times what we say is, the answer is no, it's not no, it's not yet. And we've got to do things to prepare people. In a lot of the areas that we are operating in, people have been disenfranchised for years for walking into a financial institution. And so we recognize that. 
there's got to be intentionality and there's got to be outreach. So I, I exactly exactly what you said about it doesn't take one. It's a, it's a constant discussion. So, and along that vein, um, I was, because we haven't heard from Ed yet, and I want to talk to the money because Mala talked about the pot of money. So uh, can you speak to efforts that Hope is engaged in to efforts that Hope is engaged in to um, increase knowledge and information and also the challenges that you may run into when it comes to um, spreading this information? Sure, thanks, uh, LaRonda. I actually want to speak, we've actually spent a lot of time talking about individuals and I, I want to focus uh, some of the conversation on the um, gaps in the system. Um, we're talking about the Federal Home Loan Bank at 100 and if we don't spend some time looking at what role has the Federal Home Loan Bank system played in creating, widening the racial wealth gap, then this will be a missed opportunity. There's probably no um, set of industries that have are more complicit in creating the racial wealth gap than the banking system mm -hmm. when we look at housing and home ownership. And so, you know, one of the things I think we need to spend some time looking at is how is the GSE system creating barriers uh, to um, expanding home ownership, particularly black home ownership, we're in the Delta, this is the primary demographic here. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that we see, so, so let's just spend a minute and talk about how we do it at Hope. Um, so, you know, over the last five years, we've closed roughly a thousand mortgages through our affordable housing program. Um, this is a program that you, we manually underwrite every loan. Um, we don't just stick it into an algorithm, which probably has bias from the start. We manually underwrite it. Um, we look at non-traditional indicators of credit repayment history. We're going to discount student debt. We also know, again, there's disproportionate effects of that on, on populations of color. We don't require mortgage insurance. Um, and we'll take credit as low as 580. And that's really important in rural communities. The CFPB put a report out not too long ago. It was a data spotlight, challenges in rural uh, access. And one of the points they made is that there's differences in rural communities. Credit scores are going to be lower. So as a, as a financial industry, we gotta, be, we gotta go deeper. And we gotta make sure the systems that are around us position us to go deeper. You know, like I said, we did nearly 1,000 of those mortgages that I just described, and we had significant outcomes. Nearly 80% of those loans were to black borrowers. 57% were to women-headed households. 89% were first-time home buyers, and over that period, the charge-off rate was never above 58 basis points. Mm -hmm. It works. Despite the fact that it works, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, I know this is a federal home loan bank, but those, <laughs> but I'm, <laughs> we gotta get this on the record. They will not buy that mortgage. Mm -hmm. right. And so, you know, I really wanna push the federal home loan bank system to examine internally what are the systems that it's using that is perpetuating gaps. Um, later on, well, I'll, I'll save some things for later on, but um, we'll, we'll go there. I do want to respond to um, one of the points that was brought up earlier when we were specifically talking about uh, elderly people living mm -hmm. in rural communities. And this is a place that I also think the Federal Home Loan Bank system could examine. Uh, so the SNAP program is uh, one that um, can be used to do repairs, and we use this um, quite a bit with um, our work with elderly families. One of the things we found is that um, there have been limits on the use of those funds for foundation and plumbing repairs. And when you're in the Delta, if you can't use that money to make foundation or plumbing repairs, you might as well just not have a program. Right. So, so we need to look at ways that, that we can continue to access those for those types of things. Yes, thank you. And also, just to reemphasize to everyone, um, as you all are talking, if you want, if there's something you would like to add or chime in, please turn your card because even though I have these prompts, these prompts are to get us started. Um, the, the director wants us out here to get your feedback. So really, this is your conversation. This is your opportunity to tell us what the, where the holes are, what the needs are, and what the federal home loan banks are doing well and what they are not doing well, what's missing. This is the information that we really need. Again, Joshua and I are here to 
direct the conversation, so to speak, or guide it and to make sure we stay on time and cover a breadth of topics. But again, this is your conversation. This is your dialogue. So with that said, um, I turn to Daniel and then Cindy. No, it's fine. I just wanted to add to Ed's uh, comments on the SNAP program. As an organization that does take advantage of the SNAP funds quite a bit, and we actually partner with your bank on uh, assisting elderly and disabled individuals through that program, uh, you're right. The use of the use of the funds is a restriction. It is a, it is an inhibitor. Um, and early on, so the past 10 years, we've actually been able to put 273 roofs on elderly or disabled individuals' homes within Washington County. Uh, we started out doing foundation repairs, uh, but the limit was so low that whenever you come to foundation, uh, you know, foundation repair, plumbing repairs, we found that those dollars just didn't stretch as far as we needed to, and even we've, we've even had to scale it down. And again, not advocating for higher amounts, um, but you know, most of the time, whenever you look at these roof, uh, roof repairs that need to be made and the amount of money that's available, uh, you know, most of the time we're, we're keeping it under uh, 12, 1,300 square feet uh, because with the price of shingles going up, the, I mean, we're kind of limited on who we can serve with these funds uh, because of those restrictions. Thanks. Also, if you were advocating for higher amounts, you can say that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm advocating for higher amounts, uh, you know, because, um, you know, what we've seen in the past year and a half is, you know, construction costs have gone up 40%. Uh, again, material, material costs are pushing 24, 27%, and labor costs have gone up as well. Uh, you know, whenever you start talking about the higher wages, um, you know, I have seen a good effort from some of these contractors that are trying to pay higher wages. Uh, but again, it kind of trickles down uh, to, uh, affecting the overall uh, cost of construction and being able to help these individuals. Cindy? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to speak as one of, I think it's 65 CDFIs that are part of the Federal Home Loan Bank System. Please do. Um, and, you know, when we joined, we were the second CDFI to join. Uh, maybe Southern was first, I don't remember. <laughs> but, uh, but we, um, so it's been a journey, and I, and, we made a decision among CDFIs that it was better to be inside the Federal Home Loan Bank system um, because we would have more influence rather than being on the outside with placards trying to tell you what to do in communities. And it's been a journey. I think we've had some real impact in, uh, on some of the things that the Federal Home Loan Bank system does. You know, back in January of 2020, we brought the Board of Governors from all, from every single districts together in Chicago. Don't ask me why we were in Chicago in January. We should have been in the Delta, but you know, there we were. Um, COVID unfortunately hit right after that, but there were two days of really, really good innovative thinking that came out of that, largely because there was a lot of folks within the Federal Home Loan Bank system didn't really understand CDFIs, and a whole list of probably 25 different big ideas where credit officers were sitting down on both sides um, to kind of come up with new ideas came out of that. And I'm happy to share that. It's public information. Um, but then COVID hit and we all went back, right, to our places. And, you know, one of the things that I learned during that process um, was the ignorance both sides have of each other, um, but also learned that Frankly, CDFIs are still treated very differently within the federal home loan bank system than the reg regular member banks. Our haircuts on our, our draws um, are much higher than major banks. Um, we're treated very differently than the depository institutions. So if I'm supposed to be the intermediary between big capital and what's happening in the Delta, I can't start off with an unfair advantage in terms of my borrowing from you. And that's really what the, if you look at the amount of equity I have to post versus, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo, it's much, it's much greater. And, and yet our credit losses are nil. So, um, so getting people to see, I think, something that Ed said that, that um, you know, that we are able to do what we are, we are doing without losses because we're patient, okay, and we're creative. The last thing I'll say on this point um, is that simple is better, okay? Where I've seen major, the GSEs in general, 
um, play the most interesting role is where they create some kind of pot of money and they don't put a lot of regulations around it and they let the CDFIs figure out how to get it into, into the communities that they serve, okay? I, the, the affordable housing industry has got to be the most convoluted, complicated system I've ever seen. And it, what you're doing is draining off a lot of equity that should be going to people um, by a lot of regulation. So whatever you, we start thinking about together in terms of how to do reform, I would really encourage, especially in a place like the Delta, that be, be simple. Don't, you know, don't say, okay, well, you can do footings in the, in the foundation, but you can't do the plumbing, right? Um, that kind of complication is going to prevent doing the large-scale community development that we need to get done. Julie, I see your card, but if you don't mind, I would like to hear from Calvin first, and then I'll come back to you, and then Ed. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, my apology also for your favor for disclosure. I, I am uh, on the advisory committee with Federal Home Loan Bank. Uh, most of you probably already know that. Uh, some of you do. Uh, the other thing I want to give reference to uh, in, in challenging and dealing with, uh, with housing, affordable housing for the, for the elderly, uh, with the disenfranchised communities, particularly the African American communities, uh, you will find that uh, the, the older homes and that elderly population a lot of times faced with air property situation. You're talking about next generation, a third generation housing where individual residents may be living. So that's also a challenge within, within itself. You know, to deal with that, you have an automatic you know, uh, ineligibility as far as being able to access the financing either for rehabilitation or even to do a teardown and a rebuild on that existing property. So our property, it, it is an issue, a third generation out, next generation type of wealth, and then where that, how that wealth uh, uh, is actually lacking uh, with the minority population, and particularly I can speak from the African American perspective. Uh, the other is the issue regarding, I know we talk about credit a lot, you know, from the credit perspective and credit score, but also it's income to debt ratio uh, itself, uh, as far as where the income levels are, continued inflation and the costs of living uh, and things that continue to go up, everything as far as household bills are concerned, utility bills and other ex food expenses, then the income to debt ratio has continued to uh, move where it's to the uh, disadvantage as far as those individuals uh, that are the, again, the uh, low to moderate income individuals. Uh, so you also have that as a challenge in dealing with the affordable housing housing issue. You look at uh, USDA rural development, affordable housing on the, I think the maximum limit for a home right now is roughly $368,000 as far as the maximum lending level. But when you look at the uh, income, eligible income level for one, two, or three individuals, based on that maximum limit, you know, you cannot show the income to debt ratio or uh, the ability to pay that type of note on this supposedly affordable house at $368,000. So you end up having where you have little to no lending that's taking place on the rural side uh, with direct loans with rural development. And then you have the population that is seeking alternative type of financing, the same disenfranchised community as far as ownership is concerned, but they're seeking financing from the CDFIs as preferred lenders to use the guarantee program, and then they have the same challenge. They know and realize the affordability income to debt ratio, uh, even with what you may possibly could be approved for based on credit score, uh, but income to debt ratio would not create the ability to make that loan. So you have those type of challenges, and then and the only way to do that the only way to do that in those type of cases would to be to look at some type of equity buyer. Let's do it with the equity buyer and, and uh, maybe utilizing Federal Home Loan Bank resources more in that manner of the Federal Home Loan Bank. Look at that you know, as, as a means to deal with when the present uh, language is about equity and equality, to deal with both the equality and to establish equity affordability. Uh, on the, uh, as far as affordable housing is concerned. 
equity on one hand and increase more of an equality, equal playing field as far as accessibility uh, for the resources to really deal with and address affordable housing. Thank you. Julie? Um, so I want to touch back on um, the elderly, housing for the elderly. You have um, a whole generation that was raised, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and so what ends up happening is that a lot of times people tend to overlook small problems until they become a larger problem. And it's, if there's a way that, we, and I, it's not a perfect system, but if there's a way that you can educate people to, if it's a small problem, let's fix it now before it becomes a larger problem. Um, and what ends up happening um, when we get calls or emails for people that um, need help with repairs or there's, there's only so much that you can do. And it's a matter of trying to possibly layer certain things um, because one household where they may have one issue, chances are they have multiple issues that need to be addressed. Um, if a person is able to apply for weatherization <coughs> funds, they're not going to help that family until the roof is fixed if there's a leak in the roof. So how do you fix the roof? Use the SNAP programs. Um, is the, as uh, Ms. Rock said, that if there's a limit, you know, do they have homeowner's insurance? A lot of families give that up because you have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Do I pay my medicines or do I keep my monthly um, mortgage insurance? So there's, um, taking the approach of finding out what's available to families with the USDA and weather station and how they can make it all work. Um, so education. So Ed, then Cindy. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, build on the point that Cindy made earlier about the um, disparate treatment of financial institutions, member institutions of the Federal Home Loan Bank. I actually think as part of this 100-year review that um, the, the the banking system should look at the extent to which um, there are disparate practices being used, um, and what are the outcomes. So, um, you know, we as a CDFI member, we do take a more significant haircut on the um, advances. Uh, we also have significantly higher transaction costs. We don't have the blanket liens available to us as well. We are a black owned financial institution. And so I, I wonder across the system, what does it look like? Is, is that typical for black owned financial institutions to have higher transaction costs and more um, onerous uh, collateral requirements? Um, I would, and I wonder if the incentives are aligned. You know, so you know, these would be described as risk mitigation tools. I would say, what happens if we flip the script and give uh, less onerous um, collateral requirements, less uh, lower transaction costs to the financial institutions which have the higher rates of lending to black borrowers. And this, these data are all public, um, the data are accessible, and so it would not be hard to look at these more onerous costs that at least are being imposed on Hope Credit Union, uh, institution that reported 80% of its mortgage loans to black borrowers in the last cycle. Um, or, or, or is this something that, that is, is a one-off? And so again, I just I bring that up because um, the grant programs are important. They, they serve a point, but the reality is, is those are just, they're based on a percentage of the net income of the bank. If we're really talking about reforming the system and using it to narrow the racial wealth gap, we need to look at how the balance sheet is deployed and how it is being deployed equitably. Thank you. Cynthia, then we'll go to John. Wow, so much. So um, I'm going to say both from having worked with seniors um, and also having worked with young borrowers um, as an advocate to make sure that they had education, understood that there were programs out there that they could use, help them to kind of walk through those programs there is a level of frustration. Yes, we do need education pieces, but, but even from that perspective, how do we do it in such a manner that we do not rob people of their 
integrity or their pride as they come into institutions. And yes, you can say not yet, and I, I'm, I'm absolutely a not yet person because, hey, here's what I need you to do. We're still gonna need this paperwork. You need to finalize this and we have to show this. But if we cannot do it in a manner, and that's collectively, whether it's someone who comes to me and says, hey, how can we work this out? Or how can working with a nonprofit, can we work this out? How can we educate people to understand the fundamentals? How can we do that? Because what happens is, you're right, there's this huge racial wealth gap built on housing, right? But why? And, and, and how do we go back and repair that. What will it take to say in a community where very few people understand how the system works, who, who are none banked, how do we do that? How do we draw them in? How do we make sure that they have the ability to come to the table with the knowledge, minus the acronyms, because we're all guilty of it, and say, this is what you'll need, this is what this means, this is what you're facing. So you'll have people who may make the money, and I'm gonna tell you what COVID, because people mention COVID. What COVID has done for a lot of young people is that they've helped them understand their value because they will no longer look for a local job. They will go remote and they are making more money, but we're not seeing them because they're not out in public. And so how do we get that conversation to a remote employee? Hey, there are some things you can do to make a difference because workforce development matters in this discussion as well. How do we do that? How do we educate people where they are? Because their circumstances are changing. Yes, people are leaving, but there are some young people who are staying, but we don't see them because they are working from home. And so literally, when do we see them? When they show up in Walmart. And because banking now can be done, I don't have to walk into the institution, I don't have to write a check, I can simply go online, move some money around. There are some things that we are missing when we're talking about boots on the ground, conversations, um, and an individualized assessment. So this is the Delta. I have lived all over the country. I have never, ever seen foundation problems like I have seen here. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to somebody in Dallas as opposed to somebody in Chicago or New York, then I need an individualized assessment as a homeowner because the issues that you're facing in Chicago may be weatherization. New York, it's weatherization, some other places, but down here, it's weatherization sometimes, like this weekend. <laughs> but, but, but by and large, it's the shift because we're right here. We're right here. And so while the land banks are saying, oh, we're all the same, we aren't all the same. And it really has to be based on what's important for the area that is being served as opposed to one size fits all. Thank you. John and then uh, Mala. No, no, I think you're right on. Um, you know, the, the trick is there, how do you scale that, right? And, and, and obviously there are tools that you can do that with today. Broadband is another issue Absolutely. in some of the areas, but, but, but clearly customization has got to be the key um, for solutions. I wanna go back to something that Dr. King said um, and I'll throw out an idea that probably needs legislative, administrative, and everybody else on board. Uh, but if you really want to move the needle on, you know, affordable housing and call it low income, because debt 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 coverage ratio really drives everything from the financing side. Sure. You know, could we create an advance of some sort at the federal home loan bank that's zero percent interest? Um, if it's being utilized to purchase a home of, you know, pick the dollar amount, 150000 whatever the number is, and, and that could incentivize more banks to get involved. Because at, at Southern, one of the things that we did was, was really, really got focused on our employee base, and we offered every single employee that had worked there for at least one year a 1% home loan. 
and then we put the debt on a 20-year amortization or less. So people are knocking the debt down faster because they don't have the interest carry associated with. So I don't know if that's a possible or something, but but the, the more we can do that, we're gonna. I, I like what Ed said. Let's let's come up with something that that really moves the needle here, and you know that that could really have a, a substantial impact on bill, ability to pay. Thanks. I agree. And before we leave here, we hope we get some of those specifics on what we need to do to move the needle. Sure. Um, Mala. Just going back to Ms. Hines, um, we we're trying to identify locations where we can reach the people. I think we have to think long term. I think we need to start looking at our high schools where students must be required to take some type of fi uh, financial literacy program and help lead them into housing. I mean, that conversation start very early, even for college graduates. Uh, when I attended Alcorn State University, we took a class called Adjustment to University Life, and it was about whatever they want us to know about the university. What well, same difference, I think universities must, should have a class for students to talk about financial literacy, should they school not, their high school teach it to them, but also about housing. What, you know, what do you plan on doing in the future? If you plan on being a homeowner, whatever, that training can start at an early age versus you get out in the real world and you're renting and what do I do next? Because uh, I, I maxed out all my credit cards and I'm lost. So I think it has to start very early if we're gonna change the, the dynamics of our communities. And even with, uh, I would say, middle upper upper age people um i think if we go into the churches even in our municipalities where we start identifying people in our communities that has a direct uh connection with people in their community they know their community and then you can reach out and start talking to them okay i'm 50 years old i'm still living in an apartment but guess what i really do want to purchase a home but i can go down to indian city of indianola they have a program there where they can help reach with you know, get with me to, I guess, navigate me through the process to get where I can become credit ready to be able to purchase a home. But it's more so just having people direct in your community who has a personal relationship with the people in their community to assist them to get them to the next level to become homeowners. Okay, Calvin. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, this, this is back to the uh, SNAP program, uh, I have uh, heard the same thing over and over again. It seemed like possibly there, there are some uh, uh, replicating uh, approaches, you know, a uh, 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 policy, uh, administrative uh, processes as to how rehab is being done on homes. When you look at the Community Action Agency under the weatherization program, grant program. And when you look at rural development uh, under its uh, grant uh, rehab program, uh, one, if you have a leaking roof, then we can't do anything inside of the house or things of that nature. So you have this uh, duplication. I think it would be in, in the interest of particular federal home loan bank uh, financing uh, under SNAP program, you know, then let the SNAP money be one that can be used to do the roof and show where it's going to leverage then the community action dollars uh, on the grant program because they, they normally, if they're qualifying for that particularly, uh, under the Rural Development Grant Program as well as under the uh, Community Action Agency, which is basically uh, uh, Health and Human Services, you know, where that funding come from, uh, we may be able to achieve more. So not that the same, the same policy or same requirement exists. Federal Home Loan Bank is the same as what Community Action Agency is. Community Action Agency is the same as what rural development is. Uh, well, if you have a leaking roof, uh, we can't do anything on your electrical. We can't do anything on your flooring or on your foundation. So it would appear to me then, Federal Home Loan Bank under staff could be the program that leverages or get everything else executed. You know, to start with that. Not being just like those others are, which is totally disallowable. It's a barrier stopper automatically with all three, all four of the programs. Thank you. Mr. Your card was turned, but then you switched it back. It was because you, you made the statement that, okay, we're going to talk about solutions later because I wanted to talk about some solutions. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, the, I, that was specific, but if you have the solutions now, we are ready for them. Mm -hmm. So please, okay. we, don't, we do not have to wait. <laughs> now, uh, well, you know, and, and, and 
make it. It's, it's more regulatory, but it, it's solution based to me. You know, every time I get into a housing program, look at the applications and what have you. Uh, this is for rental, home ownership alike. This is for HUD. This is for all Federal Home Loan Bank. It doesn't matter. USDA. Uh, we throw out these percentages, 4%, 6%, 80%. <laughs> and it gives no place to place. 4% <laughs> mm -hmm. of $50,000, well I said 80% of $50,000 uh, for, uh, what, give me a subdivision, Madison. <laughs> uh, is, is, is uh, well, $40,000. You come here in Sunflower County, you say 80% need of $30,000. You know, you're down to 24,000. But I am asked to participate in the same program with half the income. It, well, let me make this a little clearer. <laughs> uh, we use 6% uh, of the area income, area income, 80% of area income for most of our program, you know. And if you don't go with the lower income, you don't score enough. Right. You can't get in. Right, right. Because the bar is based on a percentage of the area income. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, we'll do that better. The, the bar is based on a percentage of the area income. Now, if we apply that percentage consistently across the state of Mississippi, uh, the people in the MSA area will get funded and it'll mean something. Mm. Those in the heart of Sunflower County, Mississippi, are going to get crumbs compared. You see what I'm saying? It's that if we're going to apply, I think that we need to make some exceptions. We need to have some waivers. Is that if we want to really impact what's going on here, that these programs are going to have to say, we're going to serve up to 80% of the area income, and we're going to give you this kind of score on your application if you're in Sunflower County, if you're in LaFleur County, Washington County. It does, you know, that happening, I don't know. But to me, it makes sense because if I'm making $100,000 in Madison and making $40,000 here in Sunflower County, uh, I'm going to get left out on those percentages. What somebody used to say, 100% uh, 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 of nothing is still nothing. nothing. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we're going to have to start revisiting that in term of policy is saying that I, w I watch tax credit. They are all moving to MSA area, basically, because the area medium income tend to be what that large city is, right? And, 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 and you, so you can say 60% of the area medium income can live here, and we can still charge $1,600 a month rent. It's building material costs the same thing in Sunflower County. Uh, the people really want to get paid the same thing in Sunflower County. But when I do my numbers, I need to be able to, to, to move those up to 80%, and it, it can't happen because I, my application won't score. I'm trying to serve a higher income population, percentage-wise, but not dollar-wise. Mm -hmm. They still low, very low income folks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Daniel. Then we'll go to Cindy. Yeah, uh, so much to comment on, <laughs> uh, but I, I agree with you. Going back to you, Ms. Hines, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I express I express that everywhere I go is um, you can't have cookie cutter policies. Uh, the issues that we have in the Mississippi Delta are not the issues that you have in. Chicago or uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, you know, I think you do have to have the flexibility to adjust with what the community needs. Um, and going back to your comment, uh, Dr. Calvin, is, you know, we do partner with a, another organization. And again, we've seen um, 
you know, the impacts of that program, um, you know, greatly increased because of that, but we partnered with WISCA in, in Washington County. Uh, and I even said this to, to Julie earlier, is with the AHP program, we come in there, we actually rehab and fix the roof, and then they come back behind us and do weatherization. Right. Um, so we are able to actually make more repairs uh, to that house and more impactful um, uh, changes to that family uh, with those partnering, um, you know, whenever we are able to partner with other organizations. Um, and David, again, kind of hit the hit, nail on the head as well. Um, you know, and I, you know, we've been um, dancing around the, the issue, uh, you know, and, and David, I believe you and Ed were both in a round table discussion we had a few years ago with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, you know, the issue that we have is capital, um, an injection of capital. Uh, you know, and that's something that we're all dealing with is the cost of construction versus what you're getting out of it, uh, you know, in rental rates. Um, statistics have shown that, you know, to build a very modest uh, house in rural America, again, this isn't Greenville, this is rural America nationwide, uh, is $185, uh, $185,000. Uh, but, but the median home value in rural America is $72,000. Um, you know, looking at statistics, and we run numbers all the time because we're consistently building, um, you know, you're losing 60 cents on the dollar. So injection of capital and injection of subsidy is really the only way to make anything happen, whether it be rental, home ownership, new development, substantial rehabilitation, uh, a substantial amount of capital up front um, is the only way to kind of move the needle, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. Same. I agree with some of that. I'm going to make an attempt to try to tie everybody's comments together. Let's see how I do because there's a lot of good things said. Okay. Um, let's be clear that affordable housing is not community development. And I think many of us came to this work because we wanted to change our communities. Uh, affordable housing is a big part of that, but it isn't the only piece of it. And if you're going to concentrate a whole bunch of poor people into one place because that's the only way you get subsidy, you're probably going to fail. Um, because we're trying to change the economics of our communities. So um, I would just encourage us, because I, I, I think you're hearing a lot about programs, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that we need, because federal home loan bank system is, is wholesale, right? Yeah. Big money trying to get it out into communities. People around this table are, are retail. Um, my organization, probably yours too, maybe yours, is kind of, intermediary between that, but but our customers and some of our CDFIs need equity capital to do what they do so that they can reach down to homeowners. And I think there's an opportunity to look at the AHP program as an equity program for, um, for CDFIs and for not-for-profits as opposed to direct so they can start to experiment with pots of money we cannot, I think Cynthia said it, um, you know, <laughs> Shreveport is not Chicago, is not the Gulf. There, we have very, very different markets, and you've got to trust the institutions that are very local to be able to, to design the programs to get that out, okay? If you try to do it up at the federal home loan bank system, you're probably going to fail, okay, because you're too big and you have to standardize. So it would be... Oh, a different way of thinking, I would say, in your 100 years to put in your mind. So, Cindy, just one follow up there. Uh, when you're saying that uh, affordable housing is not community development, what do you mean community development is? Well, com I, I think that com communities have, should, healthy communities have a whole range of uh, incomes in it. And um, they have houses of worship, they have businesses, they have lots of things besides just affordable housing, right? And I think. Uh, what David was really trying to say is, look, if you give me a pot of money and all I can do is, is help people that are at 40% of $30,000, how do I develop my whole community like that? Okay, I can help maybe 10 people in my community, but I can't really bring back economic life and breathe it back into the whole community. And I would, there might be some folks on this, in this group that disagree with me, but I, th I we're either doing thinking about the whole thing holistically or we're thinking about a piece of it. They're not the same thing. Um, affordable housing, in my mind, is a tool for good, a, a critical tool for good community development. Okay. 
I said, I'm going to have to somewhat disagree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I do think that, you know, affordable housing is definitely a driving force behind community economic development. You know, one, it brings into play during that time period, uh, uh, although it's not long term, but on, on the intermediate or short term basis, some job creation opportunity. Uh, it's also a connecting, it, it connects back into other aspects of. Uh, it could be either job job retention or other job creation based on uh, the uh, supplies that's that's required to deal with that that development. Uh, the other thing is that you know we all know that whenever you start to talk about community economic development, even from a job creation perspective or industry from an industry and business standpoint, one of the first things the industry and business look at is you know how recently uh, has that been any new development as it relates to housing in the area. They want to look at the education system, they want to look at availability of housing, uh, you know, and then uh, construction, uh, new construction within a certain time period. You know, of course, that is, that those are indicators as well, you know, uh, as it relates to the economics within that particular area, stability of that, those economics. So, uh, and, and what I'm saying is that it, it, is, it is definitely, it is, it is definitely one of those factors that fit within the context of community economic development. You know, housing itself is lack of availability of housing. Then you know that's uh, definitely a, uh, a high signal, a driving force behind out migration as well. And of course, out migration, lack of available workforce. You know, definitely not going to have business growth. Uh, you know, business development you know, for a particular particular area. And I, I just want to say we need. You know, I should say we should say we need. We do need. You know, I think that equity equity is a, is a supporting factor for equality in disenfranchised areas and communities. Be it if you are African American, minority community, but disenfranchised population, or segments of our population and our communities within this nation, particularly the Delta region. So there has not it has not been an equal playing field, and, and it's still not an equal playing field. You know, when you look at capital investment for area, you look at opportunity zones and where opportunity zones exist now in the Delta region, the more disenfranchised say, and this was legislation itself, and the decision that was made at the state level, not at the national level, not as the empowerment zone or enterprise communities were done from the national perspective, but this from the state, state standpoint. So those opportunity zones that were designed by legislation to be a driving force behind economic growth and development within those disenfranchised communities, both for CDFIs and for traditional banks, are providing for certain revenue or tax credits, and I know you all know more about that, as that legislation was passed. But when you look at my county, for instance, one of the poorest counties in the country does not have an opportunity zone, okay? Uh, now the county that I work from, one of the poorest counties in the region, does not have an opportunity zone. So, so then, that has to do with, again, has the playing field uh, been equal? Uh, are we employing and putting in place uh, policy or those things that have become policy or legislation that has one intent in itself, uh, but it is not necessarily addressing the intent based on where you have the highest volume of that population that exists right now? On the elderly population side, we need, and please keep in mind, that with the elderly population, again, you know, income to debt ratio, inflation rates of what's occurring now, those, the elderly population have set income. And when you start to talk about income to debt ratio and determining factor of whether it's going to be a, uh, a loan for renovation, a uh, combination of loan, grant, rehab, you know, whichever, uh, if you use, if you use that, as a determining factor, in a lot of cases, even credit scores as well, then you are saying you're not going to meet the eligibility requirements, you aren't going to get access to the resources uh, that's actually needed uh, to deal with this issue as it relates to affordable housing, as it, uh, as it uh, relates to dealing with poor housing conditions uh, in this part of the country or in the Delta region. I mean, that's the reality, people. And again, Check the status, look at opportunity zone, look at what opportunity zones are, what's the driving force, what's the driving factors, should there be other type of legislation or policy, uh, not to counter that, but to possibly at least leverage it, are practices that are put in place 
that creates that equity driving force for equality uh, from the federal home loan bank perspective. Thank you. That's a great segue and almost answer to another question I was about to direct to Ed, who already has his card turned. So please um, do not lose the thought that you already had, but um, I wanted to talk about factors that are preventing the federal home loan banks from playing a larger role. So we've talked about the collateral impediment that CDFIs experience. Um, and I was going to ask about conflicting requirements between federal and state programs. And um, you've, oh, yeah. Calvin has touched on that. Um, do you have any, would you, can you add to that? Um, and and particularly, particularly as it relates to um, administrative or other bureaucratic, bureaucratic challenges in addition to whatever else is on your dome, on the brain. Sure, no, <laughs> thank you. Um, so one of the things uh, that I wanted to um, build on the points that Dr. King brought up was uh, doing an examination of um, just the grant programs and, and encouraging the bank to include some type of racial equity screen and how the, the programs are being used. So let's just, let's use the AHP program uh, that is often used by low income housing tax credit developers. So we know in Mississippi in 2021, uh, of the 11 of the 25 applicants that received credits in Mississippi, not a single housing developer was a black developer. Yeah. And this happens yeah. every year. Um, now, some of that is because the process advantages developers that have received credits in the past um, that may already have existing relationships. The reality is, particularly in rural communities, the AHP program is critical to building LIHTC developments. I would challenge the bank to take a more active role in pushing the state housing finance agencies to use these programs, to use its programs to build up more developers of color. If we don't have developers of color who are participating in this program, but yet the federal home loan bank programs are being used, then the system could use its leverage to really work in partnership in places where there are gaps. So that, that's an that's a example of a place where I believe the bank could do more to partner with the state housing finance agencies to, to build wealth in the black community. Thank you. Um, John. Real quick, I I'm going to go back to, I think I agree with a lot of what you said, but I'm not exactly sure it addressed what you were saying. It, it might be easier rather than by city, county, however that area income is defined today, maybe have a state level area income. So, you know, use the highest, lowest, if you will, so that more benefit will flow into some of the other. I think that's what you were yeah. trying to say. Yeah. Okay. Um, I agree with Ed with with what he said there. I mean, it's you know, how you spend your matter, your money matters, right? And 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 having an intentional focus on that really matters. Um, so uh, we we are fortunate that we're both a bank. I say we're fortunate. We we are both a bank and we have a loan fund. So we we have two separate relationships with the federal home loan bank, and and the relationship's invaluable. The funding that you provide obviously is is a bellwether to what we're trying to achieve. So I, I, I applaud that piece of it. From the loan funds perspective, I agree. Um, they don't have the same flexibility to be able to do, and then they're not regulated in the same way that the bank is, so they're allowed to be much more creative in how they achieve their their goals, so. Cindy, and then Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I think David was talking about place um, and getting money into a place, right. right? And that's where I think we would all agree. We need the flexibility to invest in a place. Um, and that's where our, our intermediaries or not-for-profits are so important. Um, we actually just started a BIPOC uh, developers fund um, for about, uh, found a big uh, private foundation that wanted to put in about $34 million and we're at 0%. We're gonna blend it up with other foundation money and only lend to places where there is an institution led by <laughs> a person of color or a board of directors uh, of color um, and, and because we believe that that's really, really critical. So I, I guess to clarify what we we're all kind of talking at the edges about, it's about being able to say, how do we prioritize a place um, and be able to get capital into a place 
to, with an institution that's led by a person of color that will understand it, okay? And that should be fundamental to whatever the federal home loan bank system comes up with, we think. Ooh. All right, Calvin, then we're gonna go to a break, so. Okay, I, I know what you were saying as far as African-American developers, you know, I guess that's probably all the way across the Delta region. You know, you really do not have uh, many, in some case, not a zero, uh, African American developers that that's in that playing field. You know, we have done some, and trust me, it's, that's it's very very challenging uh, from that perspective. Now, and don't get me wrong, you know, you'll also find uh, in the Delta region, particularly in Arkansas, uh, there's a, there's a minimum. It's, it's like you have this club, you know, of those who are the primary developers uh, 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 within the state, and you probably have the same in Mississippi, you know, too. Uh, it's, it's like. These are the primary players for syndication and tax credit develop, developments, you know, in, in Arkansas and probably in Mississippi. And in certain cases, you'll find where they're out of state that come in because they're big players as well, you know, that can do the same. Uh, so it, it would require, a, in, in order to, 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 to put some fusion to that, you know, it, uh, it takes a lot, policy-wise, otherwise. I want to say this from an equity perspective. You know, I was in a meeting, I was listening, and apparently the discussion was taking place in Washington, D.C., uh, both uh, with Federal Home Loan Bank representatives being there, along with other institutions, the financial institution, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as well, uh, about the equity and equality perspective. That being, that is a point of discussion. That is an interest on the part of Federal Home Loan Bank, as I understand it now. Uh, uh, from the, both the discussion that will possibly be leading into legislative actions. Uh, am I right? Possibly. <laughs> I cannot confirm nor deny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had that roll. disclaimer I read earlier. As you okay, okay. Well, well, you're right. I, I, I'm, I apologize. I, I, I really should not have even. That wasn't fair. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, try, I, I can't. I'm apologize for that. I, I, I can't say that, even based on where I am. So y'all just disregard that statement. <laughs> Strike it off the record, okay? Uh, but, you know, I'm just gonna use this as an example uh, as it relates to HUD financing. Uh, in, in Arkansas, and then the policy making procedures as it normally goes when you have the entitlement dollars that comes in, uh, both from, uh, from the home perspective, if you're dealing with housing, Oxford Development Finance Authority, uh, the uh, commission, uh, AEDC, our Second Development Commission, and of course, our Second Development Corporation. These are big entitlement dollar receiver uh, cabinet point departments in uh, Arkansas. Same thing exists in Mississippi as well, those flow points. <clears throat> and one time they had to call home dollars, which was an equity building tool. You all probably had it in Mississippi. Uh, you, could, you could rebuild, uh, take an older house down, looking at the elderly population, clear title and ownership, build a new home, build a new home, uh, and 50% of those dollars, depending upon how the state dealt with their policy and their regulation, 50% of, of those dollars uh, would be, after the compliance period, comes off, but it created affordability. Now, of course, we all know that does not exist anymore, not in Arkansas. Do y'all have it in Mississippi now? We do. If so, okay, well, I need to come to Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, that was a good program. We're not doing it in Arkansas. Now, driving force behind that seemed to have been the opportunity zones and more bigger bang for your bucks with the home dollars going uh, toward where other tax credit syndication developments would take place. It may be where the majority of money is going now with the home program dollars in Mississippi also. Uh, but anyway, th that was an equity building program, something sort of model as such, I guess is what I'm looking for. Model as such, uh, posture from federal home loan bank perspective, perspective policy-wise, and how it can be an infusion uh, for CDFIs and the banks to do more housing development. That's, that's it. Uh, and Daniel, if you can get it under one minute. I'll oh, like I'm going to keep it under one minute. I just want to. I just want to make a comment for the. Uh, you know, for the record, whenever we talk about inequality, um, and again, I'm going to. I'm going to state this, um, and I've said it numerous times. Is you know, the Delta communities are 80, 83 percent African American. Mm -hmm. uh, the success of our region depends upon the African American community. I mean, we really need to. 
uh, you know, empower them to have more opportunities. And I am familiar with the LIHTC program and who the players are in the games. Um, you, I, I will say that that's a mission of our organization is to try to uh, contract with minority and uh, women-owned businesses. Uh, the last major development that we had, uh, we actually had 13.2% of the total grant funds uh, go to women or minority-owned businesses. Uh, but the problem that we had, and again, I don't know if this is a policy issue, just kind of a rhetorical question out there for everybody to think about. Um, what we come to find is for some of these larger projects, smaller projects, we have absolutely no issues, but some of the larger projects is bonding capacity yes. uh, for some of the African-American contractors. Uh, they are unable to take on these larger projects because they do not have an ability to be bonded at a higher amount. We have even tried to phase it out for them and actually do 20% at a time uh, and draw down that money in, in accordance to that way to get them on the job, to get them on the project. Uh, but bonding capacity has been a huge issue for us whenever it comes to women or minority owned contractors. Thank Just you. for the record. Now, now, now Daniel, you, you're talking about from the director's perspective, not from the developer's perspective. Uh, uh, what uh, from the developer's financing. perspective. Okay. Yeah, from the financing perspective, for sure. Probably. Yeah, from yeah. the financing perspective financing. as well. Yeah, okay. sorry. Okay, and we are going to go to a break. We will come back in 20 minutes to continue the conversation. So let's call it 2.50 as our, uh, as our start time as we'll come back. Thank you all for your comments so far. Thank you all and welcome back uh, to the second half of our event today. Uh, we're just gonna jump right back in since I think we were having some pretty good discussion uh, before we left. Uh, so LaRonda, right back to you. Thank you. So yes, before we left, we had gotten into discussions um, as it relates to equity and we want to put a pin in there and stay there for a moment. A moment. But before we get into the specifics of the federal home loan banks and how they're doing and have been doing on the equity front and what they could do better, I want to turn to um, the community advocates at the table, um, Mala and Cynthia. Uh, in the earlier part of our discussion, I heard the terms non-banked or underbanked. Um, I also heard um, financial literacy. So could you, uh, and I'll start with Cynthia, speak to um, some of the racial disparities that are prevalent in the Delta, and then after Cynthia Mall, I'm gonna ask that you uh, provide some insights on that as well. So I'm gonna take something that Ed said um, and, and walk it back. So the bank created a system, the veterans, programs created an opportunity for people coming back um, from war who had served their country. And I'll use them as an example to get homes. And from that homes developed, from the purchase of those homes through those programs, developed a middle class. And that middle class is now able to provide for their children these loans and homes because they built equity in, in that particular program. Soldiers who came back who were racial minorities did not get that treatment. And so unless you had other means, which was rare, you really couldn't do that. You couldn't build a home. You couldn't use that home to to jumpstart businesses, to jumpstart other things in terms of community development and, and, and community development and relationships. So what we have now is a system where people have been locked out. That even if we begin to talk about financial literacy, and I just mentioned, you know, one of the key things in financial literacy that we always tell people is, hey, you need to save 10% of what you earn, that's sort of the benchmark of what you should do. The reality is if you're making $7.25, $8, and your rent is $900 a month, you may have to pay daycare, you need to eat, that's always important, um, utilities, you're, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. And so the choices you make become very complicated. You cannot think about 
how can I move from housing assistance to my own home if the three-legged stool I'm sitting on really only has one leg and that leg is wobbly. So I'm, I'm literally kind of like a <clears throat> one wheel, you know, unicycle trying to just stay up. We have to understand that the creation of wealth in this country was very intentional and it bypassed collectively large groups of people. Um, it didn't just by, you know, minorities certainly, but, but there were people who didn't have economic means. I mean, this country literally started out as you had to be a landowner and male. So, so what we have to do is rethink how we create systems or use the systems that we have in place, not to give, but to develop not to throw away, but to rethink how we regulate to build communities. If the ship goes down, we all go down. We don't go down alone. So rising tides raises all boats. We are struggling, Daniel said it. If we do not, in a, in a region where the majority of the individuals who live here are minority citizens, as defined by whatever census, then we do not have an opportunity to be successful. From, I've done economic development in a past life. Here's what I know when I look at a business plan is I'm looking for some certain things. Will this idea sell? Um, what is your financing basis here? Um, who are you trying to reach? What, what are your management practices? All of these things that we ask people. But if I don't even know where to begin with that, if, because when people come to me now and say in the Delta, oh, I want to open a restaurant, I'm like, um, what other skills do you have? <laughs> Not because I don't believe they can cook, but because everybody cooks, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've got to have something that's different. If you're coming to the Delta and you say, I want to make Thai food, you have a, you have a chance. There's a chance. You, you might be able to pull that off. But you can't come here and say, hey, I'm going to open a soul food restaurant. You know why? OK, I don't even need to tell you. Because there's so many. And this is when we talk about equity and understanding. We have to put the two of those together. There is a divide. But I think that divide can be changed if we are intentional, both in a regulatory sense, in a policy sense, but also in the sense of understanding that if the boat rises, we all rise. Thank you, Mala. Yes, uh, I would say that um, I'm speaking for the Mississippi Delta because when you think about Mississippi, you have really three parts of the state. You have the coast, you have Madison and DeSoto County, and you have the Delta. Um, when it comes to equity, I would say 30% of the people here have no knowledge to what equity is. We have a system where people bank with pawn shops, they bank with convenience stores. They have a system where the money goes to a card, they never go to a bank. So first, that, that's the first piece. We have to start educating our people on uh, banking with a bank because it's almost unheard of. Then we have a situation where people may live in public housing the next 20 years of their life. And guess what? When they make it to Section 8, they think they have arrived. That is a real concern. That's the norm here in the Mississippi Delta. So when I said the sense of equity, it's almost unheard of. And then going back to our percentage of people, we're looking at about 35 to 40% of the people here this is the norm. This is how we live. So the concern is some real education. When I was talking about just the discussions, it has to start at a really, really <laughs> early age. And 
I just said start a minimum at high school because if you're at home and this is what you see home, this is the norm from my home, it's gonna be hard to change. So it has to be a lifestyle, a, a lifestyle change on how do we become homeowners? And mm -hmm. that should be the number one goal because if getting on Section 8 is, I have arrived, because you have some people who will live on Section 8 the next 20 years of their life, and then they'll try to get their children on Section 8 versus ever becoming a homeowner. So that is the biggest piece on, we say equity, they have no knowledge to what you're talking about. Now you have a working class, now I've graduated from college, um, what do I do next? And you may make a lot of bad decisions along the way, but that's why I went back to college and high school. It's going to be so important. If we're going to change the mindset of our community, it has to start <clears throat> early. Um, I think the opportunities are here with equity because the, now we do see more home ownership with my generation of young people. Um, they're working, they're, you know, they, they're educated, they're, they're moving to home. More buying more homes, but it's a large number of people that's left out. But then we run into situations where you may get a home loan, and it's a bad, uh, it's a bad loan. I ran into a friend; she got a home during the time when they had the housing divide. That situation, she paid on a loan for fifty. There was a second loan, fifty thousand dollars, and I think she probably paid for it like three or four times. And I said, listen, just pay it off. Get a loan and pay it off from a traditional bank so you won't get caught up in that situation because if you continue, to go, you will still be paying off the $50,000. I mean, it's never an ending part. So we got so many pieces that has fallen down into our communities. And a lot, a lot of it is just lack of knowledge because I'm a first-time home buyer and you, because no one educated me on this and I'm just trying to do the right thing and I don't want to live the way I did when I was a kid. You know, you know I'm in a, a very poor community and I want the best for my child. And a lot of times we do make bad uh, uh, decisions only because a lack of knowledge. So education is going to be really, really key in our communities. Thank you. Um, Dr. King, then Julie. Me? Yes, sir. I want to say uh, this, this is back to the playing field itself uh, and creating, and it wouldn't even be an equal playing field, but what history itself has taught us and what has institutionalized uh, this page and where we are now. You know, even if you look at the Civil Rights Movement, Civil Rights Movement, African American population, and what became public housing uh, created was a part of a of a segregating, you know, stru structure, a process of dealing with segregation, uh, maintaining segregation in the more urban areas. And you'll find that as being a part of history. And all at the same time, where equity existed and where there were African American uh, communities during that era and that time period, those particular communities and that, where that equity existed, then that was eminent domain as, as a part of that whole industrialization of the nation in itself that really totally uh, took out uh, the equity. And that was only by one means. These are more urban population areas. You look at Chicago and other areas of this country and where this took place from the African American perspective. That was the point of equity where those communities, not building the community itself, I invested in those community to create more equity and where there will be opportunity for the next generation of equity, but a takeaway and a destruction of the communities and to institutionalize more during that point in time period, the uh, position of segregation, public housing, and then of course, you know, the uh, out migration uh, uh, from those areas for those of wealth. Okay, to the suburb areas of the urban. Now, I've never lived in an urban area. I'm from the rural community. So, you know, I wasn't a part of that. But then you have to look at the New Deal. The New Deal, again, a part of history itself. And when that was, that, that was a movement in itself to deal with establishing and providing equity opportunities uh, within the population after the Civil War, under Roosevelt, and where people were provided the opportunity of land ownership and to create home ownership in those areas. Again, uh, that's a part of history. But again, African American minority community, disenfranchised population was not included and was left out again. So, but then now you have this next generation of wealth that does exist 
that is the result of both policy and program that was executed to create such equity. But when we talk about it now, it's like, well, I don't know, can we do that? And we don't. Then let's go to the 80s. The 80s, and when you deal with Farmers Home Administration, Farmers Home Administration were the primary sources, uh, uh, so resource for dealing with financing both home, rural housing particularly, uh, as well as agriculture and other business investments. Of course, African American and other minority population really didn't get any investment from a, from a business perspective, but even with housing. Then that was the restructuring of Farmers Home Administration. When the restructuring of Farmers Home Administration took place, the opportunity was provided by way of policy for a time period until everything had been taken care of, that you could do a 20% equity debt settlement. Now, the 20% de equity debt settlement, if that was a $3 million situation of, of, uh, of debt with the federal government, and they could take over an equity position, debt write off with a 20% equity position if it's financed by another lending institution, and those are opportunities for, I don't think CDFI has existed then, you know, uh, during that time, but, but with the banks, and we know what the, what was the, uh, what were the norms with the banking institution, African American community, then they were able to get, again, create and have an equity position with multi-million dollars of debt write off with a 20% equity position or better. Okay, in the restructure of the federal government system where policy existed then. Equity, equality, but equity existed. And use that equity to build more equity as we move forward as to where we are now. So, and those, those are just some, uh, some examples in, in why, you know, sometimes now it appears that when we start to talk about equity investment programs for equity type of investment for opportunity, uh, equity investment for equality, then it's like we've never heard of that before. And it's a part of the history. Uh, itself when you start to talk about real property, okay? Uh, real property within the system and from a policy perspective and from the government perspective. So it is not new. It is, it is not new and it still continues to date. The question is who's left out and who is looking at it from an equality perspective? Equity is not new and the creation of equity and capital is not new. But equality is what is where we have the gap. The equality on the basis of so the, the program that works for, in, in some cases, may not work for others when you start to talk about building equity. You know, in those disenfranchised type of communities we are talking about, in the areas, and those individuals. So I, I just wanted to, you know, to say that from the, when you say uh, that was the institutionalized process, them not having access to dealing with banks and stuff, now that was all a part of the uh, point of dealing with segregation and the civil rights movement, and that was institution something that still exists today, but it was institutionalized from a point of history in this country to the point of position of where we are now. Thank you for um, you all for laying that foundation. So I want to come to Julie, and then after Julie, I'm going to go in the direction of um, how the federal home loan banks can support the financial institutions in closing or addressing the gap in the disparities because I heard Mala say bad loans and good loans. And I think maybe one of the reasons why your friend and others get into those bad loans is because they're underbanked at the traditional institutions and don't have those opportunities. So after Julie, I wanna to come to the financial institutions and ask um, how the Federal Home Loan Bank system can help you make and offer more good loans to people who have been historically and continue to be institutionally um, unbanked and underbanked. Um, I just wanted to touch on the financial literacy aspect. Um, HUD has done wonders in trying to support housing counseling agencies. HUD approved housing counseling agencies now have certified counselors that have gone through um, the training and the examination process so that they can um, teach financial literacy, they can help um, individuals with establishing a household budget, um, really taking a holistic approach to a family or individual's housing situation and how can they either improve or sustain. Um, one thing I like to um, kind of encourage, whether it be um, social service agencies, 
landlords, whomever, start a resource library. Um, they're no longer doing the jump, jump start program um, or it's in very select locations. Um, but try to start a resource library. So when, a, when an individual is coming to pay their monthly rent, they can privately go to whatever area and if they're having financial troubles, um, they could pull information on how to create a budget. Um, they have the uh, Federal Trade Commission, um, the CFPB, they have free resources that you, they will send you. Um, so there is information on how do I open a checking account um, or a savings account. Um, how do I meet my goals? So there's a lot of different resource, um, resources available that they will send you for free. Um, there's a lot of people who do the payday loans. How do you get out of that? Um, so that's one thing I think is important to maybe um, have something like if it's Fair Housing Month, have information out there on fair housing. Whatever it is, there's Home Ownership Month in June. So, you know, somebody may have wanted that as a goal, but maybe didn't know how to obtain it. So you could put information out there on credit. Um, some people automatically assume I have bad credit when they don't okay. even know. So um, just that's one way to get, um, have a resource library. Um, and the, even FDIC has Money Smart curriculum that they can send. Um, Freddie Mac has um, Credit Smart, and it's an online free curriculum so they can go through um, and do that. Um, their housing counseling agencies do the home buyer education classes that take an individual from the beginning to the end to hopefully avoid predatory lending situations. Um, so that would you know, be one way to kind of help address that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So Ed, going back to um, the question that I initially or asked momentarily ago, um, how can the federal home, federal home loan banks um, support institutions in making good loans available, in particular to um, African Americans and those who have been um, historically institute and continue to be institutionally discriminated against and impacted? No, thank you again. Um, so. Some of these are just going to be repeats of, of things we, we shared earlier, but I actually, before, before going to that, I just wanted to share a story, just speaking to um, you know, the, the depth and legacy of, of unbanked and underbanked residents in this region. You know, we, we opened a branch in Itabina, Mississippi, which is not far from here, small town, 2,000 people, when the last bank in town closed their doors. So they came to us and donated the branch and gave us an opportunity to, to, to open a credit union branch in that, in that market. At the time, the bank was only offering deposit services and, um, and, and cash and checks. You couldn't apply for a loan there. You couldn't apply for a mortgage. You couldn't open a checking account. And so it wasn't a surprise then when um, one of our members at the age of 100 came and opened her first bank account with birthday money. And she said it was the first time she ever felt welcome in a financial institution. Mm -hmm. African-American woman who spent her entire life in the Mississippi Delta. That is the banking industry that exists in this region. This was not long ago. And so we have to be mindful of that. We have to name it. And so then the question is, what does the federal home loan bank system do to make sure another resident of the Delta doesn't have to wait 100 years before right. feeling comfortable walking in the doors of, of a bank or a credit union. I, I want to go back and talk about the capitalization. We talked earlier about the, about the unfair haircuts that community development financial institutions uh, receive, needs to be looked at in terms of minority depositories, community development credit unions. That is, that is first and foremost above there. Again, w what are the ways that the balance sheet is being deployed or not deployed to advance? racial equity. Uh, the community investment uh, program, you know, you, there are um, advancements that can be taken from that program which shave about 10 to 20 basis points off of the, of the total cost of funds, um, but those dollars need to be tracked into projects. And the, that is very onerous and actually makes the program untenable and just it's, it's not worth the cost of that to access, that those 10 to 20 basis points aren't worth the amount of work to track into the project use that same program to invest in the CDFIs to invest in a pool. Uh, if it's going into community development, if it's going into affordable housing, if it's going into mortgages for people of color, first-time home buyers, it shouldn't have to be tracked into each one of those, those projects. 
Um, I think the federal home loan bank system has to dramatically increase its funding of down payment assistance. We've talked about the, the racial wealth gap, its effects on its limits. We looked at it, if you look at Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Alabama, and Tennessee, all things equal, if we were to get roughly 550,000 black households into homes, then we could narrow, we could close the home ownership gap, which is right now about 28 percentage points. That's what it will take. And so, so but to get there, it's gonna take, we gotta unwind centuries of, of building the gap. And so one way to do that is with flexible down payment assistance. And so we need to, again, the, 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 the help program works well. The people who use it give the system good marks. The people who they work with, high customer service, it's way too small to put a dent into the problems we're discussing here today. Um, I think the system needs to look at best practices across the, the, um, across the system. And so what I mean by that is, you know, we might work with one federal home loan bank and, you know, we were talking about earlier the, the cost of, of building developments in rural communities and, you know, construction costs have gone up. This is not a new thing. Everyone around this table who does this knows this, can speak to it, whether it's shingles or pipe or sheetrock or glass, it's a lumber. Um, and so a project several years ago, a few years ago that could have built 60 units may now only build 40. And so one system, one bank will work with you to move that from 60 to 40 to make sure you can at least get 40 in a community. Another bank is gonna be much less um, uh, willing to have that conversation. And so what are the system, what, evaluating across the system, where are things getting done? How are they getting done? What are the adjustments that are, that are being made? How can those be lifted up and incentivized uh, to happen? Last but not least, um, I want to share one more story, and, and it's about the community of Eastmore. Um, Eastmore is a community built right outside the town lines of, of Moorhead, Mississippi. Eastmore was built to disenfranchise black voters. It was built in the late 70s to move just enough black residents across the town line so that majorities could be held to maintain a white mayor in that community. Those homes were built up overnight. They were thrown up. People died there, they burnt down, gas explosions, wiring. So when we moved into Moorhead, again, another town where the last bank closed its doors, the mayor took us there and said, what can you do to help us rebuild this community? And we said, let's figure it out. And we did, we went in there, we got private money from Goldman Sachs, we got infrastructure money from the Community Development Block Grant uh, Program, from the Delta Regional Authority, Federal Home Loan Bank money is in there too. But it was roughly $110,000 per home to rebuild 44 homes in that community. There are communities like that all over the Delta where homes need to be rebuilt. And so what will it take for this system to make those types of monies available? Because subsidy, Daniel talked about subsidy either. If we're, if we're gonna rebuild these homes to build homes where people can live in dignity that weren't just put up for the purposes of, of not just disenfranchising at the vote, but also at the ballot box, but also economically disenfranchising people. This system, the federal home loan bank system at 100 years needs to be integral to solving that problem. Thank you. Cindy, I'm so glad you turned your card because I was coming to you next anyway. <laughs> do, you, do you want to ask a question or do you just want me to respond? I want you to respond. Okay, okay. Well, I, I'm just going to build off what Ed said. I mean, it's interesting that you call yourself the federal home loan bank system, okay? I, I think that, um, but if we're really going to change communities, that system has to get all the way down to people, right? And so what are the building blocks to get to people? And, uh, and what's missing in the federal home loan bank system to, to make that happen? Um, so, you know, at NeighborWorks, we have 240 organizations across the country. Um, actually, HOPE is one of them, right? And uh, they are developers um, of affordable housing. They're community developers. They're social service providers. Um, many of them, and there's 
91 of them are also CDFIs, but they're way too small to be part of the Federal Home Loan Bank system. They would never meet your liquidity test or whatever. But we can lend to them. You know, we're big enough. We have about 142 million in assets. We could, if we were able to access your money at scale, we could put a fund together and relend to them and just service the money, okay, and let them have it for long-term fixed rate capital. Um, we've been talking about this, and what's, the haircuts are preventing some of that because a lot of equity put up, and we thought about going to the other members of the Federal Home Loan Bank system and, and accessing, having them borrow the money and put it into a fund to get CRA credit, and we would just, you know, aggregate and, and get it out. But we have to find a way to complete the system all the way down to the people, okay? Because I really do believe that the solutions are about organized people and organized money, okay? And I think that some of the organizations around this table already got the organized people part, right? So um, we got we to gotta figure out how to connect them and, and get the money to go all the way down so that the supply and the demand are all connected. So. Our neighbor works organizations, many of them, I, I, probably about half, have home ownership centers where they're doing the financial literacy that we talked about, and they, they are building um, places where people can learn how to repair their houses, and they're doing the credit counseling, and they're doing all of that, and they've got waiting lists of people that are really need this capital, but then there's this gap that <laughs> happens between having the homeowners ready and them having the money to be able to originate the mortgages. And that's what we got to fig figure out is how does this become a seamless system, okay? And so that's how I would encourage us to think about that. And I would just want to say one more thing because you touched on one of the things that we're hearing all throughout the NeighborWorks network right now is the cost of construction. It's, I have never in my 35 years seen this craziness. I mean, it is just, interest rates going up at the same time, it's just a mess. And I don't think we're gonna fix it just through financing. I think we're gonna have to do some innovation around the way we built. I was actually talking to the mayor a little bit about there's this big thing uh, being tried around 3D printing where you can build a whole subdivision in a day and a half, and they were doing it in Mexico, right? Um, so, but we've got to start thinking about that. And if we're going to build a system, it's got to incent organizations like you and you and you to be able to say, hey, I want to, I want to build a little home building shop. Many neighbor works organizations are little home builders. How do they get the equity they need to be able to innovate in the construction space? So that's where I would use the word equity the most. And then I will see to John. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Cynthia. Then John. I'm going to just tell you, th this is a great conversation. It's a great conversation for many reasons. However, there is one word, I think, that will tie together comments that Julie made, comments that Ed made, comments that I made, comments that Mala made, comments that you made. It's trust. And at the end of the day, we can talk about equity. We can talk about equality. But at the end of the day, it's trust. The people who have been shut out and disenfranchised from the system, please do not ask them to go and trust a system that intentionally disenfranchised them. Unless you are willing to do the hard work of exactly what you said, organizing both people the institutions that the community trust, and the money. It is that simple. You cannot ask people to trust that which they do not know. Now, I'm going to tell you a really brief, very funny story. My father was a pastor. He and I used to, he used to tell me, oh, you know, everybody needs to go to church. You can trust. I said, let me tell you something. If you don't grow up understanding that and knowing that, don't just walk out and assume that everybody's going to trust. And we used to joke about it. But the bottom line is that it's true there in that particular institution, but it is also true when you think about systems, any system. 
One of the things that I also work with is sort of kind of education advocacy with parents and teachers. Here's the deal. When you walk into a school and all around this table today, we have used acronyms related to housing and banking and how do we finance people. But if I've always had a bad experience in those systems and you've always used acronyms with me that I don't clearly understand, a, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to tell you I don't know what you're talking about because pride is going to preclude that. But what I am going to do is just assume you're somebody else trying to get over on me and I'm going to walk away. We have to be very intentional about building trust in communities that are underserved, underbanked, whatever, whatever euphemism you want to use. We have to be extremely intentional about going to places people trust in order to make the case. Because we can change the regulations and the policies, but if I don't trust you, if there's not someone in your system who can talk the talk and walk the walk that the community trusts, it's over. It's over before it even starts. We want to move people from Section 8 to home ownership or from rental properties and to home ownership. If we want communities to go, because here's the thing, if I have a home and then I have an idea and I can build a business, then I'm building, I'm a now another part of economic development or community development in that system. But if I never get the home or I don't understand that particular process, then I can't do the other. Somewhere, as an education advocate, I always tell people, somewhere there's the answer. Somebody has the knowledge to defeat cancer or whatever else ails the human condition. But if we don't support that, it's not going to happen. The same thing with housing. It just won't happen unless we create an atmosphere of trust. Thank you. Um, John? Did you have? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with, with what Cynthia said and, and, and others have said here. Um, and affordable housing, we've, we've talked about that quite a bit. I, I kind of want to focus a little bit more on small business um, and, and to kind of address some of those issues because I believe there's some, some very important issues there as well. At, at Southern, we, we originate almost 8,000 loans a year and half of those are under $50,000. Now, you can imagine the cost structure associated with that. So I think what you're saying there is the intentionality really matters, and, and you've got to get in there. But at the same time, you've got to have the technical expertise. Um, one of the things that we've initiated, and it's, today it's only in Little Rock, but we're, we're running some pilots with some other, with some philanthropy dollars, with some private dollars, and our own dollars, and it's called the Minority Empowerment Business Fund. And you can have cohorts that come in and they apply and they're not ready necessarily for the debt yet because debt can cause its own problems if you're not ready for that. But it's really more we put them with experts in the field and those are accountants and lawyers and marketing and sales and procurement, which may be one of the biggest, right, that creates the opportunities to do it. So I think it's that intentionality like you mentioned. Um, uh, there's been a lot of good things that have been said today. I, I, I will tell the Federal Home Loan Bank, if, you know, you, you've asked us for, for ideas here. Use your greatest strength, which is the, adva the advance program. Provide incentives to use those advances in certain ways. And you'll be amazed how much the financial industry will, will utilize those benefits. And I, I can't tell you what the number is. I, I said a 0% advance, I liked it probably because it was my idea, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but you know, if you use those for, whether it be for small business or whether, and you, and you have some good programs today, by the way, too. You, you, you need to let some of the banks know what those are. Um, I, I will be honest, I came in, you used to have a great grant program that went away and it's been replaced by a couple of other programs today. You've got some unsecured loans and you've got some 0% advances on some other things that I was not even aware of until I came in here today. So I would tell you to find ways to, to, to utilize the advanced system because with what we're seeing in the environment today with the liquidity concerns that banks see today, they're going to be utilizing your advances over the next few years greater than you've seen over the last 10. So um, 
let's find ways to, to, to utilize those dollars in a way that promotes the equity that we want to see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, David, and then I'm going to come back to Dr. King. I would just like to pick it back a little bit on Cynthia. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned education and you mentioned the father being a pastor and I was reminded of <clears throat> during my earlier years associated with school districts, <laughs> uh, there was an educational program and it was more caught than taught. Mm. More, in the basis of the program is that we can talk about it, but people really don't get interested until you can put it in a format where they can actually catch it. Right. You know, talking is, we, we, we have done this, most of us have been in this business a long time. I think Kevin and I was comparing notes and we don't know who's been around the longest. But the, the thing is, is that when people come into my office and they ask for applications, and if I don't have anything concrete, I don't give it to them because if they fill it out, they call the next day and say, where am I uh, on the waiting list? How close it, am I? And I'm saying, no, it's not funded yet. We was doing a pre-application. It's gone. I mean, the trust you talked about, gone. Zero. It's, it's, it's like the preacher that said, do what I say and not what I do. Okay. Now, that, people are smarter than that now. They're not gonna do what you say. I think we're gonna have to have some kind of delivery. Uh, I don't know what it looked like, and, and I'm glad I'm around all of you all. Some kind of delivery where people can start seeing the reality of all of this that we are saying. I mean, we talk about counseling, you know what happened when a person stayed in a counseling program for a long time and never get a house. Look, you can go there, you can spend six weeks, uh, but there's no funding for the housing program. <laughs> but I know, how, I know what to do now, but there's no funding for it. So it's kind of like, you know, you waste, they feel like they wasted the time. They know more about housing, but do they have any greater access? I think we're gonna have to come up with some kind of demonstration to, so they can actually catch on. You know, if you see your neighbor get one, that's what I love about the uh, reconstruction rehab program. Uh, one little old lady get her house torn down and rebuilt. Every little old lady in their community is coming because they see it. I mean, it's, 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 it's nothing like seeing it and, and knowing that it's really worked. So uh, I really just want to say it's more call than talk. Thank you. And uh, before Dr. King gives his remarks, I just want to note that time is swiftly moving, it and is. we have 30 <laughs> minutes left, and we are, and we are, this, it's being interjected throughout the conversation, but I want to make sure that we hear your thoughts on the federal home loan bank system of the future. So please, um, as we are going around the table, and as you continue to turn your tent cards so that we can call on you, um, please keep that in mind and make sure that you get those out so that we have it on the record. Um, Dr. King. <clears throat> I want to, so from a future perspective, uh, and this is something, maybe to call it back to the future. Uh, you know, the move, it was back to the future, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. back to the future. Uh, but <clears throat> cooperative housing, you know, cooperative uh, housing, uh, one is, could be a structure for dealing with uh, creating housing opportunities, uh, uh, affordable housing. Uh, it also will lend itself to uh, to partner for, I'm saying, moving forward uh, with uh, more diversity and partnership both with the community-based organization. Uh, so, whoa, that got me, that's my time up. <laughs> with, with, with the community-based organization, uh, CDFIs, uh, USDA rural development. You know th these models were used years ago, uh, uh, but the but the cooperative basis and, and there, there are a lot of ways that you can structure cooperatives. You know, uh, you know, uh, association from a stock interest perspective, general cooperatives. You know, but it's it's a business enterprise on one because as you know, cooperative definitely a business enterprise. Uh, 
uh, but the other, it, and it's, it's not public housing, you know, either. Uh, and it can be a means of, you say, having people at the table and then where the resources are and then what's the guiding policy for it. Because you put in place the policy for that cooperative, and just like you do self-help housing. Everybody got to participate and do so many classes for self-help housing. So to create some model cooperative where people are at the table, they're there at the table, where the equity dollars are going to be, those who choose to be a part of the cooperatives, where well, federal home loan bank investment dollars would be uh, uh, through the CDFIs or the banking institutions uh, and rural development, which can also provide equity and grant dollars to put the equity affordability, cooperative affordability in place for rural areas. So uh, I just wanted to put that on the table as what I see as could possibly be and could be a solution in a lot of areas because they have cut, said money, be, when you understand the program, there's no, no money there. 515, there's no money there now. You know, an, an RD. Hadn't been any money there forever, okay? And of course, home is it, uh, you can ask for state participation in, in supporting it. Some will say, well, that's kind of different, but it's really not. You know, some of the, some of the wealthiest entities in this country uh, are built around the cooperative model. Uh, but cooperative models for affordable housing, it could be, you could also structure them for home ownership as well. So I just want to mention that from a future perspective. So do we hear you saying And, and building equity. You can build equity also through that process. So do we hear you saying that the Federal Home Loan Bank should um, innovate or create a product that specifically supports Cooperative housing development. Cooperative housing development. Yes. Whether it be um, any particular, are you talking, are you referring to something more along the lines of advanced, like an advanced product or something more like AHP or both. Which one would be the fastest? <laughs> <laughs> Which one would be your ideal? Giving again, because you're on the board, so you do have some familiarity. I, I, with I, I think I think the advance would would, would would probably work work best. You know, uh, working back with with the CDFIs, and I'm, that's what I'm thinking, John. You know, from, from the investment perspective, I think the advance would work better. Uh, and it, you know, uh, one to move something in a, in a in a timely fashion. Two to look at where, the, you know, again, this is one administration could be another administration. While some of those other equity opportunities uh, exist under the Inflation Reduction Act through USDA, particularly for rural communities, uh, uh, that addresses the equity, you know, uh, from that standpoint, as well as uh, you know, states, you know, with the finance authority with the home dollars. <laughs> at either redirecting that or uh, at least moving it for, uh, from a plan, from an investment perspective, to be a part of those type of partnership initiative. Uh, to create some models, at least, how they work, and particularly for the southern region. You know. And I'm not being praised by the southern region of Delta now, but I, I am. Under, understood. And so Cynthia's next, but before she goes, Daniel, I want to get you queued up, because I'm coming to you next. Okay. But um, we haven't talked a lot. Or, in more detail about the supply issue, right? And so I want to pivot back to you after Cynthia and get your insights or ideas about how the Federal Home Loan Bank system can support um, housing supply needs. I know there was a convert, there was mention of um, minority-owned businesses, particularly developers and contractors who have bonding and funding issues. So how the Federal Home Loan Bank system may be able to provide support um, on, on that front. Cynthia. OK, so when we have a conversation about what's next, best, long term, what can we ask from the bank, um, Dr. King did mention, you know, historically, we've done certain types of funding to move people forward into new areas. We have to, or the bank has to, um, and I think collectively, we all have to rethink how we make this work um, in a way that is both long-term, that is specific, but flexible enough, which is it's oxymoron in some cases, but <laughs> specific, but flexible enough that we reach people who really need that. We have to come out of Dallas and look around where we are and, and what those institutions need. And they may say, oh, well, you know, we do come out. 
but are you boots on the ground? Coming out and going to an institution as opposed to going to a project is very different. And I think they have to become and understand that Yazoo Clay is not Texas dirt. And it is sometimes in many ways, it's just that simple. How can we all participate um, in a way that they gain knowledge that helps them make very specific but flexible decisions when it comes to projects that financial institutions and developers um, are working on to improve communities. Okay. Dan. Okay. Um, the supply, the supply, the need is great, um, and we know that. And, and you know, we have developed and redeveloped a lot of uh, affordable housing complex within the community of Greenville, Washington. Whoa. I think I got your mic. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, it's um, humbling to see the response that we have to some of these projects that we develop. And, and again, you know, I do want to reiterate Ed and John's comments. I think injection of capital up front um, buying down the buying down the loan, buying down the interest rate, especially right now, uh, is probably going to be the key to make this happen. I think we've been saying that now for three or four years, at least, uh, if not longer. Um, you know, we have been able to take advantage of uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank uh, of Dallas's uh, down payment assistance, which I think at the time was uh, six or seven thousand uh, dollars. But in order to make that work um, with some of our local community banks. Uh, and to be able to service what that 10% requirement was, plus also pay the closing costs and legal fees associated with it. You know, we've had to make home ownership available. Um, we've had to basically renovate a house and make it available for less than $40,000. We can do it. Um, it's a smaller house, um, but we've been able to do it. We haven't been able to do it on a large scale, but it is something that there is still a, a huge need for. Um, you know, we redeveloped Les Lane Apartment Complex, which was right across the street from our office. Um, and the day that we sat, the, it's, it was only eight units, and it was actually funded largely by the CHODO program. Um, but it, again, there was flexibility in the home program that allowed us to do that, and it was actually renovating Greenville's first uh, apartment complex. But I'll never forget it, the day that we actually put the now leasing sign into the ground, uh, we got 43 applications before we closed the doors that day. Um, Ed Gray Park, uh, which is one of our developments that we just recently uh, completed, which was built upon sustainable design techniques. It actually addressed utility cost, uh, which we feel like is the major threat to affordable housing as of right now. Um, the average utility bill for all, all utilities out there is $147. Uh, before we moved the first, yeah, uh, we used smart design techniques and used elements and natural, natural resources to help heat and cool the unit. Um, before we released the first unit, we had 400 applications on hand. Wow. Uh, it was only 42 units. Um, so again, the supply is need, the demand is there, the need is there. Um, again, we're just not seeing that 60% subsidy, 60% injection that we need to make the project uh, financially feasible. Thank you. Um, I want to come to Jewel. Julie and but Cindy, but Julie, I'm going to come to you second. But to cue you up, can you think about how the federal home loan banks could potentially extend their reach? Do you think it's enough? Is there more that they could do? And then, um, Cindy, thank you for submitting some comments to us earlier. In your comments, I believe you mentioned a rule set aside. Did you mention a rule set aside in your comments? Can you expand upon that um, momentarily? Um, how how do you think it would work? And again, doesn't have, it doesn't have to be specific, but some general ideas that again we can have for the record. Back to organize people and organize money. I think if I were you, I would try to avoid being retail. Okay. So what you can do is say, I want to put a rural set aside together and make dollars available and then let the organizations around the table figure out how to do it. 
because it's, I mean, I think Cynthia said it best, it's gonna be different in Shreveport than it is in North Dakota, than the Delta, and, and so if you either create dollar pools of funds or set-asides and, and resist the temptation to put lots of regulation around it, okay, and let the customers tell you how to do it, I think you'll get a lot more money out and it'll be more effective and impactful. Thank you. Um, Sometimes it can include all communities in rural Mississippi, um, excluding Jackson, Hines, County's going by population. I think it need to be more detailed when you say rural set aside. It may include the evolution of taxes in their community. It may be at a very low minimum to ensure that they are included and not going to community like of Ridgeland and Madison, which is still considered rural, but would be would overlook communities like here in the Mississippi Delta. So I think if we're going to look at a rural set aside, we need to be real clear about what areas we're talking about. So I, if I hear you correctly, it sounds like you're saying you agree with the rural set aside yes. idea, but it needs to be even more specific to critical and high needs areas. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to touch on that real quick. Yes, please. Um, even though Madison in, as a whole is a wealthier county, there are still pockets and areas within Madison that are rural and are low income. Um, Canton, Mississippi is one of them, that's in Madison County. Um, there's a lot of areas within Hines County that Edwards, you've got other areas that would benefit from that rural set aside. So maybe broaden it up a little bit, um, but you know, that is something that could target um, those in need. Um, as far as the question that you asked, um, as what can FDIC, do, I mean, I'm sorry, not FDIC, Federal Home Loan Bank do, um, I think more marketing and outreach. Um, there have been in the past where we've done resource, uh, housing resource events. Um, so it could be something that they, like just a marketing campaign to, sponsor housing resource events where you're bringing agencies within the community that do have social service programs, bringing awareness. Um, in the past when we've done them, um, not only are we bringing them information on down payment assistance, um, you're bringing the community action agencies in as far as their programs, a lot of social service programs because families just don't have one issue. Um, I think if um, also they could do trainings um, with nonprofits, um, sponsor training events to where they're actually letting those agencies know of the programs, how they work, um, because not everybody knows about the Haven program that helps veterans. Um, and we have a large veteran community here in the state. Um, and then, you know, the SNAP program. I just happened to stumble upon that by trying to find resources for an individual. So I think if you could, they can do trainings um, regionally um, because, you know, the needs on the coast differ from the needs in the Delta. Um, so I think those two things, marketing, outreach, and training. Very good. Thank you. Um, again, this dialogue has been amazing um, and just Again, I keep saying it's insightful, but it truly is for us. And our time is really, really, truly almost up. So uh, I think we do, we will have, um, I think, space for written comments as we continue this process. And so we encourage you to think about, continue to think about your ideas, uh, put them on paper, and um, you know, send them to us and look for additional opportunities to do so. But we do want to start to wrap up, and John, I see your card, so I'm going to ask that, because we're going to do a round robin, I'm going to go around the table, and what I'll do is I'll start with you so you can get that last comment out quickly, and then um, also our round robin um, question. And same for you, uh, Cindy, I see your card too, but whatever comment you have, you could just hold it till we get to the round robin um, part of that and just kind of merge it in. But um, to wrap things up, we would like to hear from everyone. What is the single most important unmet need and what change would you recommend to the federal home loan bank system to best fulfill that need? There's a caveat that said if no changes are needed, 
why not? But given the conversation, I doubt anyone will respond to that. So I'll just reread the first part again. What is the single most important unmet need and what change would you recommend to the federal home loan bank system to best fulfill that need? And we'll start with John and work Great, start with John. <laughs> um, that's something I'm gonna have to think about and can, can follow back up in writing on what the single greatest need is, but it's, it's always about access to capital. Um, and, and you know, look, we, I think you've heard from a lot of people today with a lot of ideas on, on what we could do with that, but, but I still keep coming back to the greatest strength is your advanced system. Use that advanced system in an intentional way. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, and I, th I don't know if Cindy said it or Cynthia said it, um, but, but keep it simple. And, or the banks will you know, go to other things that they've got going on because everybody's busy. Um, the final piece I'll give you on, on just an idea, at least in Dallas, is to start digitizing the processes. Um, we originate a lot of loans. We still have to get a physical signature on every single one of those notes and every one of those mortgages. Um, that, that adds up over time and it would make it um, anything we can do to drive cost out of the business and, and, and we're there legally. I mean, we can figure it out. Um, and, and some of the other federal home loan banks may already be doing this, I'm not certain, but, but, but anything we can do to drive cost out of the business helps us to focus our profits on the things and the mission we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. There is no such thing as a single. <laughs> but anyway, we'll try to prioritize here. You know, actually, in, in reading some of the material, and I'm gonna rush through this, uh, I looked at the partnership grant and I thought about one of the problems I ran into, and I, cause I know everybody's gonna talk about that, that about the overall capital, is that, uh, that, that there's a rule letter that say if you have a, a regulation, if you, uh, if your operating income is over six hundred thousand dollars, I think you can't participate as a nonprofit. And I thought that was the that was just crazy. Uh, we we manage uh, affordable rental housing, and the rent the, the rent revenues are much greater than that, and more like you know closer to millions. So, but that's restricted. That doesn't affect our, go to our bottom line at all. We ridden in with a management fee. So I think the bank need to look at things like that, is that you really, if you're gonna use a, an income threshold, let it be a net income or uh, unrestricted income, but not revenue. We just need to, so that's one point, but uh, we can come back in the round rock. Okay. <laughs> and so, so, so I would I would say uh, really look at ways of modernizing or even revolutionizing the balance sheet and the income statement. And and I've made the points about uh, the way the advancement system is is inequitable in its treatment of some minority depositories. That needs to be rectified. The ways uh, collateral is treated. Uh, uh, additionally. Um, the types of collateral that could be taken. Uh, right now it's only mortgages, but, but there's, I think LIHTC properties should be considered as well. Um, they, are, they are safe and they're some of the um, strongest loans that we have, that's collateral that could be used. That's on the balance sheet. And then on the income, and, and I think the system should study uh, this um, as well as, as part of the, the 100 year anniversary. And on the income statement is just to, to, to markedly increase the investments that the program is making. Every person I talk to on the program side who, who is engaged in these programs, again, they, they, they give high marks to the staff who's engaged in them, user experience, and they all say there's not enough. And it's because the need is so great, and I believe the, the system can find ways to, to increase the, the investment. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would probably say um, maybe holding back on the regulatory side and allowing the banks the more of the flexibility to make decisions that are best within their service area. Um, you know, they know the people that they serve, um, the programs, you know, what that family or individual's needs are, and so sometimes there's a lot of restrictions that prevent them from being able to help. Thank you. 
Um, I'm simply going to go back to let's let's develop a system um, from the banking side that is seamless, using Cindy's word, um, but that really ultimately impacts what we're able to do for communities across this country that are rural. Thank you. Um, I like what David said. I really do, because being from the same industry, the money that we do make, we inject it right back into the community. Um, but uh, you know, looking at, and again, I, I don't really know how this can change, but um, a lot of the financing or, or grant funding uh, partners have gone to that gap financing. Um, so it's, it's honestly now trying to find nine different sources of gap funding to make a project whole. Um, and again, whenever we're using those, I know the Federal Home Loan Bank specifically uh, has a, a concentration on 50% AMI or less, but then it kind of concentrates, you know, uh, up to 120 after that. But then, you know, you pair that with the Chodo dollars, which the majority of them are 60% or less, 90% has to go to 60% or less, and then, you know, 10% to 80% AMI or less. So it's kind of juggling all of these. Uh, different requirements from these funding agencies to kind of figure out what's the most restrictive way and whenever you start kind of putting them all together um, you, you start to realize that you have a, a lot of restrictions uh, whenever it comes to affordable housing development. Um, so again maybe uh, let's focus on some direct initiatives uh, that we can folk, you know serve within a, within a specific period of time um, and uh, you know make a concerted effort of going and, and addressing those issues. Thank you. Well, you know, I have 20 years of experience in farming. You know, I'm, I'm going to use, use this terminology. Uh, uh, unmet need is, is, is uh, calibrating, you know, uh, calibrating actual investments, you know, to uh, where you have that more equal balance uh, with other populated areas because it's not, it's not the same. Uh, so that's what's unmet now. What's unmet is calibrating investments in, in these marginalized or uh, uh, disenfranchised communities, and minority communities particularly, um, the area. And what change need, need to occur, the change that need to occur uh, would, would uh, probably be more in the area of administrative policy, maybe administrative policy of the plan those plans that are developed by the districts, the Federal Home Loan Bank, you know, a regional, a regional you know, district offices. Uh, and in certain cases, it, it may not be the plan. It may be where it requires, it, it would link back to legislation. But as I see it right now, uh, it, it, it's more linked to the administrative plans uh, and prioritizing you know, those plans to focus on where these unmet needs are and change would be. That's what a change would take place. Thank you. Well, I think the most important thing for the federal home loan bank system to do is to get capital where it doesn't go easily. And um, that means being creative about what equity means. Um, right now, the customers that are members that are closest to um, impacted communities, those especially of color, still have, are not being treated the same as the bigger banks. We have higher haircuts. So I would say start thinking about the equity that they bring to the table, maybe things like credit enhancements from foundations. Um, be creative about alternative equity because we don't have it in the same way, but it is real equity, and we've got to think about that if we're going to get money into places where capital doesn't totally go, doesn't always go. Thank you. And to wrap up, Mala? Uh, I would say place additional emphasis on rural disadvantaged communities with capital, education, and awareness. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, we are going to squeak in just under the hour like we were hoping to. So, uh, so I want to start by saying, or finish, I should say. Uh, by saying thank you to everyone that participated today. Your thoughts really are incredibly valuable as we're continuing to work our way through this process. Um, as Lorana did say, we, we are going to be opening up uh, the written comment period again early this next year. Uh, so if you have uh, further thinking on your ideas as you're flushing them out more, I know John, you said you want to think about it, do and put it, and put it in writing. Uh, and hopefully you can send all that to us soon. 
you know, I just want to say that we we had a, a very uh, fruitful conversation today that that took us through you know some some you know, some basic practical considerations like you know foundation and, and plumbing concerns all the way to uh, far far more difficult topics like equity and uh, equality that that uh, that are that are rooted uh, in the system. Uh, and uh, further into you know conversations of, of education and deployment of capital, uh, so those are all, those are not small items. Uh, uh, but I, I think uh, yeah, I will say that we will take that all under advisement, and I think that it's something that we all need to be thinking further about. Uh, so I will uh, encourage everyone to visit our website regularly, as we do update it on a right, on a weekly basis in terms of where we are, what more we have have to come uh, in this process. We are still hoping to have. Uh, several more roundtables before this year is over. I know that everyone usually stops doing things after Thanksgiving. We have decided not to be those people this year. Uh, we have several more uh, roundtables coming up, including uh, in Oklahoma uh, 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 and in uh, uh, Baltimore. Uh, and uh, so I think we more to come. And please check the website for more of that information. Uh, so th once again, thank you to everyone that, that participated today, those that came uh, to be here live with us, and also uh, everyone that was watching on the live stream. We really do appreciate it uh, and all the continued thoughts uh, that, that are going into this. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right.